the recording's going and right. uh, we can get started. All right. So I just want to say welcome, everybody. I see we have a lot of guests today. Welcome to the December Alameda County Water District for meeting. We do have a special event tonight, but I think before we start with roll call, I believe General Manager Shaver has some housekeeping announcements. Yes, thank you, President Wong. Firstly, can everybody hear me? Thumbs up. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Good evening on behalf of the ACWD Board of Directors. I would like to welcome the public's participation in this ACWD board meeting. My name is Robert Shaver and I serve as the GM of ACWD. Members of the public may participate in this public meeting either by using the Zoom application or by telephone. If you're participating by Zoom, generally we ask that all participants mute their microphones unless speaking. You may also be placed on mute by the district secretary. The district secretary will unmute participants at the appropriate times when the board is receiving public comments. In Zoom, you will be able to view presentation materials as they are presented to the board. And at any time, you may submit a question or raise your hand in the Zoom application if you're muted and have a question that you would like to ask the board of directors. If you're participating by telephone, please put your phone on mute to assure the best sound quality for everyone. And I understand that Zoom allows you to use your dial pad, star six to mute or unmute, and star nine to raise your hand. You may download presentation slides from the district's website, which is located at www.acwd.org, and then you can follow along that way. This Zoom webinar will be recorded and will be made accessible to the public for future viewing. The board has three closed session items that will be covered near the end of the meeting. While the board convenes privately in closed session, members of the public may remain logged into Zoom or stay on the phone and you'll be informed of any board reports or actions once the closed sessions are concluded. Again, thank you very much for attending this evening. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. With that, Ms. Marku, roll call, please. Director Zakbari. Present. Gunther. Here. Sethi. Here. Weed. Here. And Huang. Here. Director Akbari, would you lead us in the salute to the flag, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you. Thank you, Director Akbari. Next is um, election, uh, oath of office by re-elected directors. So Ms. Marco, I believe we could take this in alphabetical order. So we have Director Akbari first, and I believe Director Akbari has a special guest that would be swearing him in. Yes, uh, I'm lucky to be uh, joined tonight by Assembly Member Bill Cork, who's going to be conducting my oath of office. Yes, I must say, um, uh, Director Ak Akbari is, uh, is a good friend and uh, someone who I admire very much for taking on a large responsibility as a young man. We honored him in the Capitol uh, as I believe it was the youngest uh, Muslim elected to office. Um, so he is a, he's an example to the, the rest of the country of, uh, of good citizenship and of the um, contribution of the Muslim community here. And we're, we're getting more and more members now elected. We have a city council member in Hayward and uh, we are, we're very proud that we are electing people from all types of backgrounds. And it is a compliment as well to the people of this uh, district, uh, this water district, that they are electing someone named Aziz Akbari, not a name that a few years ago one would have heard here, but they, are, they, they recognize his contribution and elected him. And I'm very proud now to actually be in the water district. So that being said, and by the way, I'm, I'm proud of all of the electeds in my area, but Aziz is just my special friend. Um, so Aziz, 
um, we will go through the swearing in. So say I and say your name. I, Aziz Akbari. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental, mental reservation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion. And then I will well and faithfully and I will well and faithfully discharge the duties, discharge the duties upon which, upon which I am about to enter. I'm about to enter. Congratulations again. It is so good to have you uh, here and we're all applauding. Thank you, assembly member. Appreciate it. All right. Very good. Okay. So, Director Gunther, now it's your turn. Um, so, if you like. Just a second. I believe Director Akbari was supposed to say oh, something. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, do you want me to sign the form now? Yes, please. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do so. And you have a witness, right? <laughs> yes. I have a witness here. Uh, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna sign and then print it in. And I'm lucky to be joined by my father today who's acting as my witness. Very good. Glad to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, just so that the district can confirm we've uh, completed the form. Thank you. Thank you, Director Akbari, and welcome back on the board. Looking Thank forward to serve another few years with you. I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, do, we, uh, do I have a moment to, uh, to make a, a quick comment? Yes, you do. Wonderful. Well, um, Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us today at our uh, ACWD board meeting uh, and for the oath of office ceremonies for Director Weed, uh, Director Gunther, and myself. It is an absolute honor and privilege to continue my service on the board of directors at the Alameda County Water District. I'm grateful for the confidence that you have bestowed, yet remain humbled by the work that we have ahead of us. I wanna take a moment to thank my fellow candidates in this campaign, former Director Marty Kohler, Ramesh Gopalan, and Director John Weed, who each advocated for the issues that are so important to them and to members of our community. And of course, I wanna extend my heartiest congratulations to my good friend and partner, Jim Gunther, without whom I don't think we would have had as successful a campaign as we did. I also wanna take a moment to thank my fellow directors, Sethi and Huang, uh, as well as our dedicated ACWD staff who I've had the privilege of working with over the past four years and look forward to working with uh, over the next four. And uh, let me also take a moment to thank Assemblymember Bill Quirk for taking time out of his schedule tonight to conduct my oath of office ceremony. Um, Assemblymember Quirk has been a great mentor and friend to me through my time in public office and has always been someone who I can depend on for advice and counsel. And thank you to all of my campaign team, my supporters, uh, everyone who helped highlight the issues that we're so passionately fighting for, as well as the broader communities of Fremont, Newark and Union City, and the 65,000 constituents who came out to support our vision. Uh, over the past four years and throughout this campaign, 
we have remained focused on the major issues that are affecting our community. We continue to advocate for improvements to our infrastructure by way of ACWD's main renewal program and the technology investments that we're making. We remain focused on affordability and expanding our low income rate assistance program so that no family in our district has to decide between putting food on their table and paying their water bill. We also continue to push for sound fiscal policies, including paying down our pension and OPEB liabilities and remain steadfast in our commitment to protect our environment and the life that depends on the same waterways that we make use of. Uh, ACWD must continue to lead on these issues in the state and we wanna continue being a model for a well-run water district and government agency. The work that we're doing is all in the goal of protecting our most valuable resource for generations to come. This is a unique responsibility, especially given my age and background and the challenging times that we're living through with the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic downturn. But I hope to provide the continued leadership over the next four years to accomplish the goals that we've set out. Thank you so much. Dir Director Akbari. This yes. is Director Sethi. I would like to congratulate you on your reelection and to all your families and friends that are here this evening. I'm hoping later this evening when we have election of new board officers that I may be able to put your name into nomination to be the next president of the board of directors of the Alameda County Water District for the new coming year. And I just want to say you honestly earned it. Thank you. Director. Absolutely. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Bari, And thank you, Assembly Member Cork for attending the meeting and be joined us be able to join us today. So Ms. Marco, I believe we're going to get to Director Gunther next. All right, Director Gunther. Okay, oh. let me let me see if I can figure out this is kind of new. <laughs> no, you're not. You're All right, not. please, please raise okay. your right. Hold on, I have to let somebody okay, else yeah. in this meeting. Uh, okay. All right. Raise your right hand and please repeat after me. I, I, James Gunther, do solemnly swear or affirm, to solemnly swear or affirm, that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, against all on enemies, foreign against, and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, to the Constitution of the United States, to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter the duties upon which I'm about to enter. That's it, thank you. Thank you. And I will now, <laughs> thank you for the, the clapping. <laughs> <laughs> now I will give a shot here at uh, signing this document uh, and getting my witness. Yeah, you can come down. My, I'll get my wife to witness. Um, the dog's handwriting isn't that great. Where? Good side right here. Here at the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. Okay, we're all signed up. Excellent. Director Gunther, can you show us the signed document just for the record? Yeah, now we're asking a lot here. Um, uh, 
I'm going to turn that. Uh, having a hard time with the aqueduct there. Maybe if I back off. It, it doesn't seem good. Maybe I'll flip it upside down. How about there, that? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love Zoom meetings. <laughs> so are we going on to the next one or does well, the director got the one to say a few words? I'll, I'll, say, a few, if, I'll say a few words if it's uh, the right time. I'd like to thank my, uh, my fellow uh, candidates in the election. It was a well-fought election. I've been through a couple of these now. Director Whedon, both of I have been through a couple of these. And I'd like to thank them, Director Weed, uh, former Director Kohler, uh, Romesco Pollan, a uh, great new guy. Um, and mostly, you know, Aziz, when I ran together, and I really, really want to thank Aziz and his team. They were great to work with. They all, you know, it, it was stressful, and but there were some fun times, I will say that. And I really appreciated all the help that team brought and all of my friends. And so to everybody, I'd like to say thank you. We have a lot of work ahead of us, um, but we have a great team. And I'm glad that Aziz, I'm very proud of Aziz, that he's back on the team. And John, of course, John and I, we're senior here. We've been here together for a long time now. And uh, I always look forward to working with John and certainly Paul and Judy, I'm really happy to be back with you. So I'm glad to be back on the board again for another four years. And I think we got a lot of good stuff to do and we're in good hands. And to everybody out there who helped and supported me, thank you so much. Deeply honored and, and appreciative of that. Um, to Assembly Member Quirk, thank you. And to Aziz's team that I worked with, those folks, you're fantastic. And uh, everybody, um, I just, I can't say enough. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Gunther. Um, I am looking forward to working with you for another few years. Welcome back to the board. Looking forward to work through all the challenges with you also. So I believe next is Director Weed. Oh, there he is, okay. <laughs> all right, John, please raise your right hand and say, I. Aye. State your name. John Weed. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? Do you solemnly swear or affirm? That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, I will bear true faith and allegiance, to the Constitution of the United States, to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge, that I will well and faithfully discharge, the duties upon which I'm about to enter, the duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you, John. Well, thank you. Um, let me do, go through the signature block here. I have the good fortune of having one of my tenants still in the building. I'm calling from my office. So um, let me um, put this for Garrett Moore, who is a more and more uh, graphic artist. And if you just witness the back, and then we will flash that in front of the uh, camera. Okay. So to witness my signature here. Thank you. OK. Here is the, uh, do you need to see the witness? <laughs> There's the, the document. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank and you. Uh, Thank you, Director Wing. Um, would you like to make a comment? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
<laughs> the, the gallery has, uh, has uh, applauded. The, interesting, uh, starting a 26th year on the water board, Jim Gunther and I were elected in 1995. And thankfully, we do not have term limits. We're being able to establish a degree of uh, knowledge and uh, background in the water world, which, as Director Aziz noted, is a long term commitment and uh, long term investments. So I wish everyone well and uh, look forward to another four years. Thank you. And I noticed that uh, hopefully, uh, somebody from Cork is on still with us. He and I served on the uh, Bosca Board, Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency for several years. So, thank you. Thank you, Director Wheat, and congratulations. And I look forward to another few years of lively discussion with you. <laughs> so, with that, um, I am going to say we're done with the oath of office, and congratulations to my three fellow directors. Welcome back to the board. I'm definitely looking forward to having our great discussions again. So with that, let's move on to public comments. Normally we ask members of public who may address the board on any issues not listed on the agenda, which are within purview of the Alameda County Water District Board. I'm going to put in a slight twist today. So members of public may address the board on items that's not on the agenda and related to the oath of office, since I see we have a lot of guests today that come to attend the special of the office. So if you wish to address the board, this is also the time um, on related to the other office. There will be a three minute limit for each person. So with that, if you wish to address the board, please raise your hand through the Zoom app or if you joined us by phone, uh, please just speak up. I am not seeing any hands. All right. Um, Ms. Bartul, can you verify that you're not seeing any hand or not seeing anything? I just wanna make sure I'm not missing anybody. That's confirmed. All right. So with that then, let's close the public comment and let's move on to consent calendar. Do I have directors that wish to add items to the consent calendar? Yes, I will make a motion to add items, <clears throat> excuse me, five, three, five, four, mm -hmm. Uh, five, six, five, seven, and five, eight to the consent calendar. Uh, President Wong, this is Director Sethi. Yes, Director Sethi. Uh, I, I would like to remove uh, item 5.8 just for a very short uh, question and a couple of comments. All right, so Director Akbari, would you like to amend your motion? Yes, I will amend my motion to add 5.3, 5.4, five, six, and five, seven to the consent calendar. Thank okay. you. Do I have a second? A second. Ms. Markle? Director Zakbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Sethi? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Huang? Aye. Do I have a motion to adopt the consent calendar as amended? I'll make the motion. Thank you, Director Akbari. Second? I'll second. Thank you, Director Gunther. Ms. Markle? Directors Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Sethi? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Huang? Aye. So with that, let's move on to action calendar item 5.1, please, General Manager. Thank you, Madam President. First is General Manager of the District on behalf of myself and the entire ACW team. <laughs> We are uh, we're 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 really thrilled to have our directors Akbari, Gunther, and Weed, as well as directors Wang and Sethi to work with this year. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, so California Water Code Section three zero five two zero provides that all the directors shall one elect one of their number president and two may elect one of their number vice president pursuant to section 2.2 of the Alameda County Water District Board Rules and Code of Conduct and Resolution 1871. This election is typically held at the first regular meeting in December each year. The directors who are elected president and vice president assume office at the close of the meeting at which they are elected. And I previously emailed all five directors the district's recent history 
of the officers of the board so that you should have that information available to you. And so the recommendation this evening is by motion, adopt resolutions electing one, a president, and two, vice president of the board. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Do I have a motion for nomination? Uh, uh, this is Director Sethi. I will uh, put into nomination Director Akbari to be the president of the board for the following year. I'll second that, John Weed. Directors Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Sethi? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Huang? Aye. Hey, Aziz, you can't vote for yourself. <laughs> yes, he can. Yeah, it's not junior high school. <laughs> All right. Do I have a nomination for a vice president of the board? Director Sethi again. I will nominate Director John Weed to be the vice president of the board for the next calendar year. And I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Thank you. Directors Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Sethi? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Huang? Aye. Let's move on to item 5.2, please. Thank you, Madam President. Section 7.2 of the Alameda County Water District Board Rules and Code of Conduct, that's the board rule, state that regular board meetings are generally held on the second Thursday of each month at the hour of 6 o'clock p.m., with the exception of the April regular board meeting, which will be held on the second Tuesday of each April. For calendar year 2021, due to a holiday and a known conflict, the regular board meeting in November uh, will be held on the third Wednesday, also at the hour of 6 p.m. In addition, staff is proposing to conduct several board workshops with the board at 4 o'clock p.m., which are considered special board meetings pursuant to sections 7.3 and 7.5 of the board rules. Both regular and special board meetings are open to the public. In order to provide advance notice to the public and to allow board members and staff to plan their annual schedules, staff is proposing the schedule of regular board meetings and board workshops slash special board meetings that are included in your board packet for board adoption this evening. So the recommendation is by motion, adopt the proposed 2021 calendar of regular board meetings and board workshops or special board meetings of the board of directors. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Um, with that, any questions, comments from the directors? Uh, John Weed, um, did we do we still have the May twentieth uh, meeting scheduled for a for a possible board workshop? Uh, no, uh, the possible board. Uh, what we're what we're proposing is a, a board workshop on May 19th, which is a and, Wednesday, and a possible board workshop on May 27th. So May 19th is a Wednesday. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. There was a conflict with Bosk, and thank you for changing it this year. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Director Weed, and it dawned on me that I have omitted to allow the public to comment on the previous items. <laughs> um, Okay, so with that, I actually will open this item up 5.2. Do I have any members of the public that wish to address the board on item 5.2? Please speak up now. Raise your hand in the Zoom app, or if you are just on the phone, please just speak up. I am not seeing any hands. So do I have a motion from the board? I'll move the uh, calendar of meetings uh... I'll move the calendar meetings for 2021. I'll, I'll second. second the staff recommendation. So that was Director Sethi. Okay. Directors Akbari? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Sethi? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Huang? Aye. So with that, I have a request for a short break. It's 6 30 now. How about that's come back at 6 40? Yes. All right. So that's resume the board meeting. Uh, Mr. Shaver, I believe you have an announcement for us. 
Yes, thank you, President Wong. I see we still have um, a, a reasonably large number of participants in this board meeting. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware that the yeah. ceremonial part of the board meeting, the oath of office has been, that's concluded. And uh, yeah. the board is engaged now in the regular board meeting agenda. And so if you were here for the oath of office and you know, you'd like to excuse yourself, that's no problem, but you're more than welcome to stay and, um, uh, and, and uh, participate in this board meeting. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. So let's see, we ended at 5.2. So the next item is item 5.5, correct? That is correct. And I believe, Ms. Marcoon, you need to um, direct our party. Actually, direct our party. I believe you have an announcement, and Ms. Marcoon needs to put you in the breakout room. Yes, uh, I have a uh, real property conflict of interest with the item coming to the board, uh, item 5.5. And so uh, on that basis, I'm going to recuse myself from this item. All right. So Ms. Marku, I'll ask you to do your magic and invite Director Akbari to a separate breakout room, please. I believe he has gone, right? Uh, he looks frozen, but I can still see him. Yeah, he's still one of my participants on, okay. Oh, he disappeared. Yep, perfect. Item 5.5, .5, please, Mr. Shaver. Thank you, President Wong. Item 5.5 .5 involves the authorization of amendment to professional services agreement for engineering services for the Kurtner Road booster station and Canyon Heights booster station upgrade projects. And uh, Mr. Stevenson, our manager of engineering and technology services, uh, will just say a few words about this item and then we'll uh, give that item back to the board president. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaver and good evening board and members of the public. This is a an amendment to our existing professional services agreement with Schaffen Wheeler, who is our engineering consultant engaged in support of two existing or ongoing capital projects, one at Canyon Heights um, Road Booster Station and one at the Curtin Road Booster Station. Um, this particular amendment uh, has to do with the Curtin Road Booster Station and the need to add some additional scope to that contract having to do with some structural modifications of the station um, and the addition of um, structural engineering services in order to support that. Um, and then also the addition of some vibration analyses that we feel is appropriate to <clears throat> maximize the life of the future pumping infrastructure within the station. So staff's recommendation is by motion, authorize the general manager to execute an amendment to the professional services agreement with Schaff and Wheeler, consulting civil engineers, in an amount not to exceed $38,619.90 for design of the Curtin Road Booster Station Upgrade Project and Canyon Heights Booster Station Upgrade Project, jobs 21247 and 21267. I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Comments from Director Sethi. Director Sethi? Um, I'm gonna move the staff recommendation, uh, but with a couple of comments to share with the rest of the board. Uh, I was part of the uh, community presentation for the Canyon Heights Booster Station upgrade project. And uh, I had discussed with uh, Mr. Stevenson, uh, Mr. Aarons and Bob, uh, Mr. Shaver, uh, the possibility of doing some uh, good neighborhood uh, upgrades around the Canyon Heights booster station, uh, just aesthetic, aesthetic things like uh, planting new uh, water efficient uh, plants and drought tolerant uh, gardening around there because it's uh, kind of an intersection for the entire neighborhood and uh, it looks very industrial. And so, although it's not included in uh, the, the budget right now for what we're approving, uh, I would encourage the staff to uh, uh, take a look at what they can do to improve uh, the look of that uh, uh, corner. Um, and uh, 
and uh, the neighbors that were part of our meeting were very receptive to that idea uh, that it would help help out uh, just uh, improving the look of the neighborhood. Thank you, Director Seppi. Any other questions or comments <clears throat> from the directors? I'll, uh, I'll comment as well on that. I, I was at the, I attended of the same uh, community or uh, community outreach meeting with director Sethi and heard his comments and, and agree I think it's probably a pretty good idea to take a look at that uh, for a second person thank you Paul thank you director Gunther um director we any comments no I'm, okay then I will staff recommendation I will open this up to members of our community if any members of public wish to address the board, please raise your hand in the Zoom app, or if you are only on the phone, please speak up. I am not seeing any hands. So with that, do I have a motion? Yes, I, I am moving staff recommendation on five, item 5.5. .5. Thank you, Director Sethi. Do I have a second? Uh, I'll second. <clears throat> Thank you, Director Gunther. Direct, yes, sorry. No, Directors sorry. Gunther? Aye. Sethi? Aye. Weed? Aye. And Huang? Aye. Ms. Marku, when you have a chance, please bring Director Akbari back. Thank you. He's, is he back yet? No. I am not seeing him yet. I think we lost him in Kansas. <laughs> we lost him in virtual land. Happens. But I know Gina to get him back. I, I see that we actually have additional participants since uh, Mr. Shaver made the announcement about the ceremonial part of the evening. And it's like people have been coming into our meeting with some expectation here. So I think the, the word needs to be repeated. Either that or they're here for item 5.9. Oh, oh yeah, that popular item. I forgot about that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Director Akbari is back. Yay, I can see him. All right. <laughs> All right, so moving on to item 5.8 then. Thank you, President Wong. <clears throat> item 5.8 involves a resolution adopting mitigated negative declaration and mitigation monitoring and reporting program for a clean energy program including the multi-site solar photovoltaic project, Whitfield Reservoir, Reservoir Site Project, and approving the project. And, and staff is happy to review this item, but if there are just questions, we're happy to respond to questions as well. Um, I believe Director Sethi has questions or comments. Yeah, I, I have just a f some uh, very short comments and a couple of questions. First of all, I went through the uh, committee report from October and then uh, through the entire mitigated negative declaration documents. And I just wanna compliment staff on all the work that was done leading up to uh, approving this resolution and especially all of the uh, neighborhood outreach, which I was really not aware of uh, and the responses to each of the citizens in the neighborhood within 1500 feet um, that uh, uh, provided uh, uh, maybe two dozen questions about uh, the project. <clears throat> My um, comments are that we followed the letter of the law, which is to go out 1,500 feet. But uh, in my own opinion, I think we should have done a broader outreach to that neighborhood because of uh, all the traffic and the people that uh,
drive into and out of uh, that neighborhood. Um, so hopefully at some point in time, we could have a, like a community meeting out there, maybe at Mission San Jose High School, which is just down the road, or Chadbourne Elementary, something like that, to discuss what we're doing and answer community questions. So I highly encourage the staff to do something like that. Um, again, I'm very complimentary about all the work that was done on the mitigated negative declaration. And uh, <clears throat> um, it clarified a lot of things uh, uh, for me about this initial solar project that we're doing in the community. So my questions are, uh, have we selected a vendor yet for the uh, public uh, uh, private partnership and where are we at, at, at this uh, stage of engagement? Uh, <clears throat> yes, Director Sethi, and um, I'll, I'll quickly just point out uh, we are planning on additional outreach to the community, um, not only associated with this site, but as you are probably aware, we're um, pursuing solar at uh, several other district properties and facilities, and so we would be um, looking to do a, a fair bit of additional public outreach associated with the overall program at multiple sites. Um, with regard to the selected vendor, we are, we've gone through, well, we're, I, I would say we're in the middle of a competitive recruit, uh, pr um, process, procurement process. Um, staff's uh, uh, team, the project team, uh, together with our consultant has uh, selected um, our um, you know, presumed um, highest scoring um, solar developer. And we're in the process right now of negotiating the specific per, uh, power purchase agreements that would be um, implemented here. Um, it's, a, it's quite a process. Um, if we cannot come to a, um, a, uh, an agreement in terms of the terms and conditions of those um, power purchase agreements, we would move on to the next um, highest scoring solar developer in accordance with the procurement program that we have. So, so that's, that's where we are currently. We're optimistically, I think, um, targeting February board meeting for bringing back um, uh, that uh, set of agreements to the board. Um, but, uh, but time will tell in terms of the negotiation process. Okay, my second question is, um, <clears throat> have we engaged with the city of Fremont Planning Department, uh, do we have to go through any um, uh, city approvals or hearings before Planning Commission or City Council, because this is affecting an entire neighborhood? Yeah, it's a good question, Director Sethi. We've engaged with the City of Fremont on a number of occasions um, through the development of the project and the, um, the planning that we've done, laying the groundwork for the scope of services for the um, solar developer and so forth. Um, we've uh, laid out the needed uh, permitting and approvals from the city of Fremont through that process. Those are included in um, our um, agreements that we would be executing with the solar developer. The solar developer would have um, the primary responsibility for securing any state building permits and other approvals from the city of Fremont. Um, but we have definitely worked with the city um, through the process thus far. All right, uh, two more questions. Uh, the city of Fremont has a uh, uh, sustainability officer with a team of people working on uh, trying to lower the uh, carbon foot footprint of Fremont as a city. <clears throat> and uh, I feel like we're making a contribution uh, to one of the cities in our service area. Have we... Uh, shared with them, that staff, what is, what we're doing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another good point. I think you're right. I think that our program is very much in alignment with the city's sustainability initiatives. Um, yes, their program manager is very much aware of our, of our program. They've been supportive. Um, I'd say we've had support from, um, uh, from their sustainability folks, from the planning folks. Um, and, uh, um, and so I think that they acknowledge that this is uh, a step forward um, in terms of overall sustainability within the city of Fremont. So uh, yes. Mm -hmm. 
did we hear hear any negative uh, uh, comments from people in the neighborhood? No negative comments. Uh, we, um, as you know, we conducted our AB 52 um, consultation no. with the uh, Ohlone tribe who um, had a number of questions. We worked through um, some modifications to our mitigation measures as a result of that. No <laughs> negative comments. Um, uh, and in terms of feedback from the public, it was just mostly questions. Um, there, was, course, there were questions related to access to the site. There were questions related to aesthetics, primarily you know, what was gonna be the fate of the existing vegetation around the site and the landscaping, which is seen to be very positive by the surrounding community. And they didn't want anything to happen with that. So, um, so there are questions mostly, no negative comments. Okay, my last comment uh, is uh, right in line with what you're talking about here. Uh, I, I grew up uh, close to that neighborhood, uh, near, closer to Gome School, but uh, Mission Ranch was, uh, you know, part of where I grew up too. And uh, I'm very familiar with that site and reading through all of the, uh, uh, questions that came in and comments from the residents, I would again encourage us just like I did on item 5.5 to do some additional aesthetic improvements that will shield the neighborhood on Palm Avenue from uh, um, the, uh, the solar panels and uh, Driving by there recently, I was even thinking that there might be a set of uh, a, a second uh, series of trees behind the current ones that are there, or bushes uh, like oleander or something that uh, um, enhances uh, the neighborhood and shields them from direct view of the solar panels while not obscuring the sunlight from the solar panels. So I think there's some actual uh, uh, landscaping improvements that we could do around there on Palm Avenue uh, that would really help out um, uh, and, and provide a neighborhood enhancement. So I'm just hoping that we will take a look at that as well. Thank you, Director Seppi. And I'm sure staff will keep that in mind when they go to the design of the project. Mr. Shaver, do you have a comment? No, I was uh, just agreeing that we will keep it in mind when we design the project. Okay, thank you. Um, do I have more questions or comments from the board? Uh, Director Wee. Director Wee? We had a board workshop and I supported this project at the time based on the numbers and data given to us by our consultant. Following that workshop though, I attended a hearing a session at the Association of California Water Agencies that pointed out that there was an extraordinary glut of solar power coming on the market. And the economic analysis now for solar is suspect. When I asked about natural gas, I was told that the cost effect would be 14 cents per kilowatt hour. I subsequently learned that with Triple P, it could be nine cents per kilowatt hour. The problem with solar is it doesn't truly address our 24 seven requirement for backup power requirements, which we're going to also now have to do. And we're not able to take care of both of those elements. The second part concern with this project is that it is a public private issue. And the only way, way we can make it anywhere near economically viable is to have tax credits with the uh, that the private partner will benefit from. It was my understanding that those credits were to were good through the end of December of this year. And I don't know that they have been renewed. They may well be renewed given the congressional uh, makeup in the last election. So I would encourage us as we go through this to do individual and in independent economic analysis on each project and look at the possibility of incorporating natural gas as a fuel supply or an as an alternative to solar. It's, um, I know it's the energy source du jour, but the economics, particularly based on the huge glut of solar on the market now, I don't know that the economics are gonna hold up. And if they do for the moment, will they hold up within a, a very short period of time? 
So thank you. Thank you, Directory. Any response from staff? Uh, I guess I would just mention that the um, the business case does rely on the existing um, investment tax credit program. Um, that has not been modified, at least to my knowledge, um, anytime recently. Um, the, the credits available under that program are declining over time. So that's one of the reasons why it's important for us to um, keep moving forward on the project. It does affect the economics. We do evaluate the economics. That was an important part of our evaluation of the proposals received. We're conducting our own um, uh, modeling uh, based upon data that's being furnished by um, the solar developers. And we're going to make sure that um, the program has a positive economic impact on the district. Um, I'd also say that nothing that we're doing has um, would take away from our ability to implement other programs and other measures in the future, say uh, fuel cell or natural gas based um, power generation. Um, but it, it's thus far, it's not been an objective <clears throat> of the project to, um, to provide for emergency backup power for various facilities. This will help, but that's not been a driving factor for the program thus far. Look, let me make one comment. I don't wanna get into the economics here because John has a, uh, a persuasive case that natural gas may be cheaper, but uh, throughout the Bay Area and California, one by one communities, are their city councils are now uh, saying all new development will uh, be exclusive of natural gas. There will be no natural gas in any new housing developments or business developments unless it's absolutely required. And uh, from the sustainability team at the city of Fremont in their presentation that they gave recently at the Chamber of Commerce, they said that Fremont is going to uh, most likely move uh, in the same direction to declare uh, uh, all new development without natural gas. And it's not on the cost base, it's basis, it's on uh, the basis of trying to lower the carbon footprint of, this, of the city. And if we have a clean energy program for our district, I think we need to take that into consideration as well. Thank you, Director. Uh, let me follow up a little bit of a comment on that. So Director, we, um, by all means, but before we go into it, I just want to remind the directors that we actually have a fairly long agenda and we know item 5.9 is going to be really popular and it's going to take a while. So I would ask for your indulgence and be concise, please. Thank you. Fortunately, we're a special district and we are not held to the uh, code requirements of the city, local cities. Natural gas is an extraordinary uh, product which is clean and has minimal carbon impact. The policies we're speaking about are not economically based or even rationally based. They're more faith-based, I would call them. And uh, while we seek to for environmental purity, it needs to be done with some sense of rationale. And our requirements for 24 seven supply of the water supply and operation of our district, beg us to stay with natural gas as a source of uh, energy because it's 24 seven. Thank you. Thank you, Director Weed. Um, I just wanna recap that staff has indicated that we will only move ahead with this project if there's economic benefit to the district. So that's just keep that in mind. And with that, I would like to open it up to members of our committee. If any members of the public that wish to address the board, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or if you're only on the phone, please speak up. President Wong, I just wanted to, uh, oh. I just wanted to, you know, to keep it concise. I, I uh, agree with uh, everything that Director Sethi has, has said in both of his comments on this item. Thank you, Director Akbari. And uh, Director Gunther, same thing. Thank you, Director Gunther. And I am not seeing any hands or hearing anything. So I am just going to close the public comments section of this item. So with that, I think we had our Q&A and our comments. Do I have a motion for this item? I'll move 5.8. I'll second. 
Director Zakbari. Aye. Gunther. Aye. Sethi. Aye. Weed. I'm going to abstain and always explain your abstention because I, I'm concerned that we're going down a path that um, even though we assure ourselves we're going to have economic support, the comments by the board that they were prepared to uh, reject natural gas really concern me. And President Huang. Aye. So with that, let's move on to the popular item of tonight. Item, well, second popular item for tonight, item 5.9, please. President Thank you. Wong, I'm just going to step out for one minute here, so I'll be right back. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, President Wong. Item 5.9 pertains to the review of a proposed water-related rates and charges initiative and setting a public hearing. And kicking off this item will be our manager of finance, Jonathan Wunderlich. All right, thank you, Mr. Shaver, and uh, good evening, members of the board and members of the public. Uh, the board met uh, in August and again in October in financial planning and rate setting workshops where we discussed a wide range of issues. And uh, at those workshops, it was requested that staff prepare a cost of service study. And then in October, it was requested that we prepare a rate proposal for the board to consider that includes 2% rate increases for each year for uh, 2021 and 2022. And so staff is here this evening uh, to present the results of the cost of service study and uh, the rate increase proposal. And so uh, I will now turn the time over to Sydney Alm, our supervising financial analyst who will lead us through the staff presentation. Uh, with us as well this evening is Sanjay Gar from Raftalis uh, who will be presenting the results of the cost of service study uh, and has served as our financial consultant uh, through this process. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Alm. Thank you, Mr. Wanderlich. Um, I would like first to share my screen, if you don't mind. Um, Ms. Marku, would you allow me to share my screen? Okay, can everyone see my screen? Uh, we, we can see it. Okay. All right. Okay, good evening, President Wong, um, members of the board. Um, I'm Sydney Alm, Supervising Financial Analyst. Um, I will be presenting part of the um, presentation um, and then our financial consultant will present um, the other part of the presentation. Um, this is our, the outline for our presentation this evening. Um, I will um, present the, I will review the financial workshop timeline and uh, the financial plan review. Um, our financial consultant will um, uh, review the cost of service study, uh, the proposed uh, water rates and charges, um, proposed dedicated fire service line rate, um, as well as the water shortage emergency stage rates. Um, I will return to uh, review our miscellaneous rates and charges, uh, facilities connection charges, conservation uh, rebate, and um, provide what the next step would be. As Mr. Wanderlich had indicated, um, uh, the board uh, conducted uh, four workshops. Um, the first two workshops were uh, focused on the budget. Um, that was in May. And the two other workshops uh, were in August and October. Um, those were focused on uh, water rates and charges. Um, let's see. So, uh, All right. So, the, um, so at the October, at the August workshop, the board, um, as Mr. Wanderlich indicated, um, the board gave the staff direction uh, to prepare the cost of service study um, that includes the analysis of the dedicated fire service line. Um, at the October workshop, uh, the board gave staff direction uh, to prepare a rate proposal uh, for board consideration um, with a, a two percent increase. Uh, for each of the next two years. Uh, this evening, 
uh, the board could choose to set a public hearing uh, for those uh, the proposed water rates. Um, the public hearing would be uh, on February 11, 2021. Um, now we'll go over the um, overview of our financial plan. Uh, Sydney, maybe this is just on my screen, but I feel like your slide is cut off a little bit. Would you mind maybe adjusting the screen? Yes, let me, okay, is that better? Let me reduce. Can you see that now? It, I, actually, I think you can make it bigger. Oh. Would you, there you okay. go. That's okay. perfect. Thank you. Okay, is that the full? Okay, hold on a second. Is that okay now? The last one was actually fine. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, so the district's financial planning model um, is a long range comprehensive spreadsheet uh, model um, of the district's revenues, operating and maintenance expenses, capital projects and fund reserves. Um, the financial planning models uh, provides the revenue requirement uh, to enable the district to set water rates and charges uh, to generate sufficient water revenues uh, to support district's operations and meet short and long-term obligations. Um, the financial planning model includes key assumptions um, that include the following shown there. Um, these assumptions were included in the scenario that uh, staff presented to the board at the October workshop. Um, there are no new assumptions um, since then. Um, bill water demand is assumed at 35 million gallons per day uh, for the current fiscal year and increases to 35.15 uh, million gallons per day starting in fiscal year 23-24 and in each subsequent year. Uh, $5 million in cash contribution uh, plus $1 million in annual operations and maintenance uh, for the potential uh, partnership purchase of the N3 Ranch. Um, increased debt financing for the AMI project uh, from $14.5 million uh, to $19.5 million uh, to help with cash flow needs. Um, revenues from the proposed water rates would go towards additional funding for pension and other post-employment benefits liability. Uh, with the additional funding, it's estimated that the plans uh, would be fully funded uh, by June 2030. Um, the financial planning model also includes the updated cost estimate uh, for the Delta conveyance project um, and the dedicated fire service line revenues. Um, you'll hear about that um, later this evening. Uh, three new positions are added uh, to address various district priorities. Uh, there are no changes to the current approved uh, CIP. Um, so the financial planning model assumes a water revenue adjustment um, of 2% increase in 2021, 2% uh, increase in 2022, and 3% um, increase in subsequent year. Sydney, just to, to clarify, um, the three positions that you had um, in the previous slide, those are net new positions, uh, correct? Not um, positions that would be replacing other uh, other positions that may be eliminated. Those are net new positions. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I also should clarify that um, back in 2014, uh, the district had uh, 239 FTE employees. Um, so even with these three proposed positions over the next two years, um, we would still be lower than that number. Thank you. So this next several slide will show the charts from our financial planning model, um, which includes all the assumptions that I just described. Um, the top chart uh, here shows the ending balances uh, for the district's general fund um, with the low balance of $67.1 million um, in fiscal year 24-25. And that's approximately $400,000 above 
um, the reserve target. So it's barely above the reserve target. Um, the cash balance is, is a little bit higher in the following year in fiscal year 25, 26 um, at six and a half million above the, the reserve target set by the board. The bottom chart shows the projected bill demand increasing uh, slightly from 35 MGD uh, or million gallons per day uh, for the current fiscal year uh, to 35.14 uh, MGD for each uh, subsequent year. Uh, this uh, chart uh, shows the water debt uh, coverage ratio and our CIP and funding sources. Um, debt coverage ratios compare um, the district's net revenue uh, to total debt service. Um, the district uh, continued to main maintain strong debt coverage ratios as shown on the chart. And um, the district has very high um, uh, credit ratings. Uh, the district's current uh, credit rating is AAA by S&P and AA1 by Moody's. Uh, the bottom chart shows the district's total uh, capital improvement program um, by various funding sources. Uh, totaling over $300 million uh, over the next six years. Um, general fund uh, makes up about 80% of the total. Um, the chart also, also shows the new debt uh, for the AMI uh, projects uh, of 19 and a half million that, that is assumed in the financial planning model um, for fiscal year 21-22. So these metric shows the district's operating revenues, uh, compare that to operating expenses. Um, the rate and charge revenues, compare that to uh, revenue requirement. Um, <clears throat> so the top chart shows that our operating revenues, um, <clears throat> that there's a, uh, there's a gap. So look at um, fiscal year 22, 23, there are funding gaps <clears throat> when we compare operating revenues to operating expenses. Um, what this means is that the district uh, relies on other funding sources, uh, mainly uh, primarily for this particular um, um, chart uh, is that the district relies on property taxes revenue um, to, uh, to fill that gap. Um, the bottom chart uh, compares the rate and charge revenue. Um, that's, that's the revenue that's generated from um, or um, commodity and, and service charge uh, primarily, um, and to the re re revenue requirement. Um, what's revenue requirement? The revenue requirement is really um, the district's total O&M uh, plus debt service. Um, so as the chart shows that the rate and charge revenue is sufficient to cover the O&M uh, expenses uh, and debt service. However, um, it is not sufficient uh, to meet, uh, to pay for the o and and debt service, plus uh, pay for the general fund CIP as a represented by the, the green bar uh, there. So the red line is, is below that. So again, uh, the district relies on other funding sources uh, uh, to meet uh, the revenue requirement and supports its general fund CIP. So the district's uh, total expense budget for fiscal year uh, 2021 uh, amended budget is $175 million. Um, the, the pie charts to the left uh, shows um, the breakdown uh, of that $175 million expense budget. 34% uh, of our expense budget uh, goes to labor and benefits, 32% um, for capital projects, 18% um, for a water purchase, and, and the remaining 16% is all for, for operations and maintenance. Um, with the proposed 2% uh, water revenue uh, increase, um, which equal to approximately $2.1 million uh, per year, um, it would allow the district to um, provide additional funding uh, towards um, or uh, unfunded liability and funded liabilities specifically or pension and other post employment benefit liabilities. It would allow the district to uh, save approximately $10.9 million um, in long-term savings um, for our district customers. 
and, and with the additional funding, um, the, the pension and the, the OPEP plans would be fully funded uh, by June uh, 2030. And that's uh, two years sooner than uh, with our um, current 15 year schedule. This is showing, uh, this chart is showing the average um, water bill comparison um, with the district's uh, current, uh, uh, current rates um, and the proposed rates uh, with uh, against other water providers in the region. Um, we decided to exclude name not for um, to you know, not being transparent. Um, we have other charts that shows uh, agency name uh, 1 to 33, if interested, we can show that. So um, but this, this slide doesn't show the agency name. Um, with the current uh, or current uh, water bill, right now the average is $130.15. Um, with the proposed 2% increase, uh, it would go up to $131.70 in 2021 and 134 uh, dollars and 35 cents in uh, 2022. Um, currently we're, we're a rate, uh, our water bill is in the lowest third. Um, with the proposed rate, we're still uh, below uh, kind of halfway point uh, there. So we're below 50% um, of other agencies. This slide um, shows the district's past due balances uh, from June 2019 uh, to October 2020. Again, this was presented at the October workshop. We updated to include um, the October number. Um, the average past due balances um, over the past 12 months is approximately $771,000. And the average past due balances that are over 31 day um, is $292,000 over the past uh, 12 months. This is a new chart uh, for the board. Um, so this, this one shows the, the number of past due accounts, um, which is represented by the blue line, and the percent of that past due account that are for residential customers, <coughs> represented by the, um, the orange bar. So if you look at the chart, April and April, um, about 29% of past due accounts are for residential customers. Um, in the past three months, um, that number has been about 76%. Sydney, this is uh, Director Sethi with a quick question. Sure, yes. When it says residential percentage of past due accounts, I thought the left scale was actually off I, uh, by 10 times because we have about 72,000 customers. So if uh, you have at, at 7,000 accounts, that would be about 10% or 100% on your scale here. Um, isn't this like 1%, 2%, 3 4 5 up to 9%? Actually, this is the, the percent on the left is the percent of the account that's on the right. Um, for example, in October 2020, there's a roughly um, 3,000 or so accounts um, that, that has past due balances. Um, and of that amount, the bar, the bar chart shows that it's about 78 or 76 percent of that 3,000 is residential. Yeah, and so Director Sethi, what's, what's kind of, I think, throws us off about this is um, how many of the past due accounts are commercial accounts, even though they represent a small number of overall district customers? Yeah, okay. So when I went through the pre-reading here, it wasn't really clear to me, and I was uh, looking at the left scale as being comparative to our total residential. So at 100%, it would have been 7,000 accounts. So it was kind of confusing. I thought at 5,500, that would be about 8% of our total residential accounts. So 
it's not clear on this chart. I would ask for a revision so that it's clear that it is residential versus commercial. Sure, we will uh, we'll look at some updates to this. I think the main point we're just trying to convey with this chart is that in the last you know four or five months, we're, we are seeing an uptick in how many of the past due accounts are residential. Um, John Weed, if I could ask a question. Um, or do we still have as, um, the desirable situation of zero uh, past due accounts for master meter residential facilities? Um, I'm not sure if it's still zero or not, but it, it, it's, if it's not zero, it's a very low number. Uh, it's very unusual to have those master metered residential accounts um, become past due. Okay. And that is be a growing percentage of our uh, customer base. Um, Sydney and John, a, a quick question. Um, do we have any information on how many of these residential accounts that are past due are also enrolled in our Help on Tap program? And if a customer that's in the Help on Tap program does fall behind on their payments, does that affect their enrollment in the program? So uh, we don't at present have any reporting on um, related to Help on Tap. Uh, I think technically, according to the program rules, uh, a customer is supposed to stay current when they're in help on tap, but that's not something we've ever enforced. So, so we don't disenroll somebody if they fall behind. John Weed on a clarification. My understanding is that none of the help on tap for, uh, participants are in a master metered situation. Correct. Uh, we have it for single family residents only. Although I think there's an extraordinary opportunity to look at the master meter accounts for developing a separate rate structure and one and, and sub metering that could address what's really the, the population which is in need. They're not the single family homeowners owning over a million to $2 million homes. And I think Director, we, we all do respect. We could have that discussion when we talk about rate structures and how we want to build people. And we could also have a very good discussion about there are actually a large population of residents in the Tri-City area that actually rent a room in a single family home. I personally actually know a family that rent a room in a single family home. So I think there are different circumstances that we need to discuss and we well, should just allow Mr. Holm to finish his presentation. No, that's wonderful, but those individuals are not paying a water bill. Um, actually, they are because there's one person that pays the water bill that owns the house that, and they will split all the expenses. But we could have that, ex that discussion some other time. Mr. Holm, please proceed. So, sorry, if I can oh, just- yeah. uh, Sorry, Director uh, Aquari. On, on my question, if, if possible, to can we have that information on on the uh, program? Uh, so to help them tap uh, participants who are also past due, and uh, maybe that can come back to the finance committee. Yeah, absolutely, we can. Um, the finance committee agenda for next week hasn't been published yet, but we do have uh, an item on the agenda related to past due accounts, and uh, we'll see what we can. Uh, you know, kind of figure out between now and, and next Tuesday regarding help on tap statistics. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Director Akbari. Um, any other questions? If not, I will ask Mr. Ohm to proceed with his presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ohm, floor is yours. Thank you, President Ohm. I, actually, that was the sli last slide of this part of my presentation. Um, I'm going to pause for any additional question before I turn over to our uh, consultant. Well, perfect timing. Um, any questions or comments from the directors? Um, Director Wee? John Wheat again. A concern I've had is the ratio of uh, fixed cost to variable cost. That was not part of this presentation. And I would encourage us to uh, look at that. We did receive some data that showed that uh, in the, in the as a memo to the members of the finance committee. It showed that our cost of water power and chemicals, our variable cost was $21.5 million a year. Our variable income 
was almost approximately $80 million a year, a 336% markup. So the extraordinary inability we've had over the years to be able to do a reasonable budget that is reliable because it fluctuates with extraordinary um, levels is because of this leverage. And I would hope that we could in our presentation look at trying to bring into balance the marginal cost with marginal income and fixed cost with fixed income. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Director Wee. I just want to remind the board that um, the board, the majority of board gave direction to staff to do a 2%, 2% across the board fix and commodity rate increase. And that's what staff is proceeding with. Let me also point out at the last meeting, we also had a presentation that showed that 95% of the rate increase was going to be needed for fixed cost, 5% for variable. And yet our actual numbers are in reverse and we're going in the wrong direction. And I believe we have a different interpretation. Um, and we had that discussion at the workshop. But at this point, uh, if there are no additional comments from directors, I would like to open the floor up to members of our public who has been very patient waiting for this item. Um, if there are any members of the public wish to address the board or have questions on the presentation so far, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or speak up if you're only on the phone. I am not seeing any hands or hearing anything. So Mr. Ohm, thank you for your presentation. I guess we're transitioning to our consultant. Thank you. Good evening, um, President, board member, staff and public. Um, I'd like to do our presentation associated with the cost of service and the proposed rates. Let me just get this set up. And you should be able to see a screen. Yep, we can see it. All right, that's good. All right, let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you again, um, virtually, um, to do the cost of service and proposed rates. So our agenda for today is to go over the cost of service, review a little bit about the concepts behind it. Um, we, I'll be relatively quick, but we want to be just comprehensive to, um, to talk about that. So in case someone's new, in our discussion, they can um, get informed about that. And then talk about the cost of service, um, service charge, that's the fixed charge, the commodity, the private fire lines, and then eventually the proposed rates. Um, and then we'll also be talking about stage rates and the next steps. And I'll be getting more in detail on each one of these concepts. So cost of service, um, and the first question of course is why do we do this and why is it important? Well, the main reason why we wanna do this is first, it's just good um, principle. And the cost of service is that we're looking at your cost structure of running your utility. We're looking at your rate structure and we're mirroring those two together. There are some flexibility within that parameter um, that we can do, but um, there needs to be a logic and rationality behind the rate structure. And the reason why we do that is it's just good um, rate making. It knows that everyone's paying their fair share. Also because of Prop 218, there's a legal requirement to do that. Um, so in California, um, the voters approved um, the California constitution. First with Prop 218, it's in our constitution to make sure that water is proportional to the cost of providing that service. Also in our constitution, um, Article 10, talked about using water reasonably and preventing waste and the beneficial use arguments. Um, so there's a little bit of a balancing act. Most, most of the time, the court rulings have been focused on Prop 218, but there are some recent court cases um, that have talked a little bit about Article 10 and the harmonizing of those two concepts. One of the most important um, legal case out there, as you may know, is um, San Juan Capistrano, where a group of ratepayers sued over its rates. Um, the appellate court ruled that it didn't meet the proportionality. And the main thing was, is there wasn't a rationality. It wasn't this administrative record or document. Um, we've written that uh, administrative record document. It's um, lengthy, you have a copy of it. If you have questions about the rates, I encourage you to read it. Uh, it is tedious, um, but because we wanna show the rationality and logic and we wanna make sure people understand that we're not arbitrarily or just randomly choosing numbers. There's a mathematical formula, logic and rationality, and I'll be going over that at a high level associated with it. 
So the main thing about it is that we need to show this nexus. You know, we need to have this math behind the report. Um, we need to show the work and that's what we've done with this administrative record. So again, if you have questions or if the public has concerns, I encourage you to read it. Um, it should be publicly available and um, it's there. And really the cost of service just addresses this concern that first, you know, your, your, your cost model of providing service. So you have different sources of supply, you have costs for those infrastructures, and then you have customers who use the system differently, specifically with meter size and how much capacity that they have. Those should be mirrored to each other. So we wanna have a logic between the cost of providing that service and the customer's behavior so that no one has a cross subsidy. And this is an example, because um, a lot of times people, when they think about water, they go, well, water's water, it's 24 seven, you know, what, what matters. But the thing is, is that we use water differently. And here's an example of two systems. The red line, you see they use a lot of water in the summertime, in the wintertime, this, um, system one uses the water pretty flat. And system um, two um, would have a larger capacity. They have a lot more infrastructure to meet that demand. And so that's the concept here is that those who need more system capacity, specifically with meter size, should pay for more. So what we do is, is we first determine how much revenue we want to collect. And that's what um, the finance group has done. Sid, um, Sydney um, talked about that. Um, we look then into your budget and we ask ourselves how much of your cost is associated with water supply, the different sources that you have, conservation program, base delivery, um, which is average demand, extra capacity, which is a peak summer use, meter maintenance to maintain those meters, customer service, so when people issue call or when you issue a bill. And then we ask ourselves, where should we collect that, whether it's um, the fixed or volumetric. We also allocate these costs differently based on the type of use. So water supply is based on HCF, delivery again, based on HCF, um, peaking, it could be based on the meter capacity ratio, meter maintenance based on the meter size, customer service based on each bill. And then once we have these cost components, which the report, as I mentioned, um, highlights, we start adding them up. And we use these logics and rationality to determine the volumetric rate, and also the service charge rates, and we add them all up. And that's what I'm gonna be showing to you in a second. So some of the major assumptions is that we use the 2020 budget. So these, these rates that I'm gonna show you, these cost of service rates, are, collect the same amount of revenue as the 2020. They do not, it does not include the 2% increase that Sydney just talked about. So once we do the cost of service, that's like the alignment of the car, getting the cars nice and straight, the tire alignment, then we add a 2% on top of that. And those are the next rates. We're still maintaining the fixed and variable as mentioned. Um, we had some discussions about that. We talked about how much um, revenue and stability you have. Um, we looked at core water sales. We asked ourselves, well, if, if reduction occurred, how much vulnerability you, you, you had based on our professional judgment we believe that you don't have much vulnerability because of the sales, the rate structure you have, and also because of your reserves, you have healthy reserves. So because of all that, um, what we're suggesting is that we keep the same level of fixed and variable. If we do increase the fixed charge, um, yes, it does help with revenue stability, um, but then there's that balancing act with affordability and people controlling their bill. And that marginal benefit is, that's a policy discussion that you know the board needs to, um, side, um, but based on discussion that we had and what I recall hearing, and someone can correct me if I misinterpreted something, we were comfortable with keeping this ratio. So now let's go into the cost of service rate. So again, these are rates collecting the same amount of money as um, fiscal year 2020. So again, we look at the capacity ratios of the meters, we, we do this equivalency of the meter size, because the concept here is that larger meters have more instantaneous capacity in the system, and they can use the water. We take into account all the number of meters. We have the cost of issuing the bill, um, that's $5.86, as you know, that's the same regardless of the meter size. We have the meter um, service cost. We add those together. Oh, and then we have also, excuse me, that's the maintenance meter. And then we have the capacity, uh, potable meter capacity. We add these three together and we get the proposed by monthly charge. Again, collecting the same amount of revenue. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that this proposed fixed charge and your current charge, again, this is the apple to apple now because no revenue adjustments. 
um, there are some changes. And it's normal when you do these cost of service, every time you do one, you, have, you haven't done one in five years, we always see a slight change. And that's because of budgetary changes that occur, um, increases in meters, um, customer growth, that's just a normal thing. So, um, you know, there are changes. Um, the, the results here, what it does is that it reduces actually the five eighths, three fourths inch meter, as you can see, um, and it increases the larger meters, which tend to be non-residential. So we did the same analysis for commercial, I mean, for um, commodity, excuse me, where we, again, we look at the water supply cost. This is your blended rate of buying water from SFPUC, your groundwater, which you don't buy, um, and, and, um, and the state water um, project. We have all these, uh, that's the average cost with the water loss. We have the base delivery cost. We have the max day, max hour, max days when we use the water in the morning, in the evening when we get back home. Max, um, that's max hour, excuse me, max day is what we use in the hot summertime periods. We actually know those incremental costs, again, through the cost of service. We have revenue offsets. The revenue offsets are from your 1% tax um, allocation and also the state water contract. We add those up and we get the rates. Now, you do have a small amount, a very small amount of outside customers. They don't pay this property tax and the state contract. So they shouldn't get the revenue offsets. So it's again, this, this is that fairness argument. They don't pay for it, so they shouldn't benefit from it. And so again, we have the math here and we show that, well, they should be higher. So they're 64 cents higher. Sanjay, what is yes. the definition of an outside customer? I'm gonna turn that over to John. Yeah, so the district actually provides distribution water service to 24 accounts that do not live within what I'll call like our political boundary. Um, and so as a result, they're not assessed the property taxes um, like for the state water and we don't get a share of their 1% allocation. So it's a small number and um, I think they're potentially located uh, in the southern area and like a very certain area of southern area of Hayward uh, where you know kind of I think through the outgrowth of the water systems that they've been connected to us. I see okay thank you. Uh, John Wheat if I could on this chart what when we talk about water the cost of water supply it'd be helpful if we had a separate chart which identified what we included in that I believe it's more than water, uh, the power, chemicals, and the actual water. Um, when we look at our income statement, our balance sheet, we use different numbers to com come up with that same uh, amount, and even though we use the same title. So it would be helpful to me to understand what we're talking about in cost. Yeah, and um, Director Weed, I can clarify, there are some distinctions between what's here and what is in the information uh, I provided to the Finance Committee recently. Uh, what you asked for was strictly the variable costs of water supply. And so uh, these numbers here are gonna be based on our full water supply costs, including fixed annual payments to the state water project and the cost of dis district staffing to manage the groundwater basin, uh, for example. So, so there are some distinctions between what's included. Okay. My understanding is that KUA has a, a policy was that water supply is the cost of the water, the power, and the chemicals, which is a true variable cost. Um, I, I'm not familiar um, with KUA um, in, in the sense that what they've said about that. I, I thought they're not as um, um, active anymore. Robert Shaver is president of COA. Oh, okay. Well, then, Robert. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just thinking about w what you meant, Director Weed. I, I'm not quite sure where you're coming from. Can you elaborate? Well, in developing a budget, I would hope that the variable cost is a, uh, is a variable cost, is a marginal cost. To bring that to commodity is a bit of a challenge, but. If you're going to be able to do a budget with any degree of confidence, you need to match variable costs with variable income and fixed costs with fixed income. Yeah, I think, you know, at least at this stage with current water demands, staff feels 
reasonably comfortable that we can make budget projections. Uh, so for example, last fiscal year, our budget assumed we would have build water demands of 34 MGD. The actual build water demands at the end of the fiscal year were 34.58 MGD. Uh, so that put us within about a 2% budget estimate on that part, or about, you know, within about 1%, one and a half percent overall on water revenues. So yes, certainly we recognize there's some uh, unpredictability, but uh, we do feel that, you know, at least what we've experienced recently, that uh, we've been pretty close and that we have put uh, reasonable budgets together. In the last drought, we had a very uh, we had a drop of 23% in water sales, which was leveraged down because we had this three um, about three and a half percent or three and a half times the um, the ratio on variable cost to variable income. In 2015, to give you an example how difficult it is to do a budget, we came up with a budget on June 30th which estimated we'd have a $15 million shortfall. We've had about a $20 million shortfall in each of the prior years. We ended that year with a $25 million uh, surplus, a $40 million swing on a $100 million budget. That's an example of how unpredictable this process can be. We've had good fortune in recent years of stability and we've leveraged it up and we've pocketed almost $4 million a month because we're selling more water than we had forecasted. We have had a hundred million dollars net income over two years. So with a $125, $130 million budget, that's pretty good. But we're leveraged, we're, we're structured to sell more water and profits profit significantly when we do. Yeah, and, and Mr. Gar will, will later in his presentation get into the stage rates proposal. Uh, and we did not have stage rates in place as a district during the recent drought. And, and that is of course intended to help manage the, um, the revenue and, and cash flows when there's a water shortage emergency and water sales are significantly reduced. Right, and it's leveraged down. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays. Thank hey, th this is Paul Sethi. Uh, before John started speaking, I got all these strange pictures on my computer and uh, lost the presentation. I don't know if anybody else saw it, but there were all these religious uh, uh, icons coming up and uh, very strange uh, uh, stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what happened, but I, I saw the same thing. And I'll just ask Mr. Gar to reshare his screen uh, where he's at in the presentation. It was bizarre. Yeah, I think what happened is that uh, somebody's cell phone somehow got involved. Okay. All right, I got I got the presentation back now. All right, sorry about that. Yeah, I, I also saw that. I didn't know it was on, I don't think it was on my side, but something happened. So, um, so we've covered this slide, which talks about the rate components and how we derive the rates. Again, meeting that nexus requirement with Prop 218. Next question is, is well, how does it change? Um, so as you see, the inside customers do not change. Um, the outside customers did change. Um, they actually um, dropped slightly by five cents. And again, that's a normal process. Whenever you do this analysis, updated property tax, updated costs, things move around and there's always just a little bit of a realignment. Um, and, and that's why we recommend you do this every five years to do this. So we've talked about the service charge. We talked about the meter charge. The next thing we wanna talk about is private fire lines. So what is private fire and what are we talking about? So we're talking about the cost of providing fire service first. And so the district is, um, you know, provides capacity for that service. We estimate that the district needs to be able to provide a, a service for four hours of fire at 4,250 gallons per minute. And we worked with engineering um, with that to determine what's the appropriate amount. Then, what we do is, is once we know how much the cost is of total fire, we ask ourselves, well, how much of that is public fire and how much of that is private fire? And we allocate that based on the number of public fire hydrants and based on the number of private fire lines. We go through that logic and methodology. So we know what the cost of public fire is, which we all pay for 
And then the private fire, which there again meets their nexus requirement and the rationality for that to provide that cost. In addition to the actual additional capacity that they need to pay for, there is also a cost for the customer service. There's a bill that they get and the cost to maintain the, um, the tattle uh, the meter um, at that end so that nothing inappropriate occurs. So again, we went through the same logic. We looked at the, the meter, the, the private fire line, lines. So these are not meters, these are actually um, lines. So it has a little bit of different capacity ratios. Um, we look, uh, if, you're paying a, if you're looking at those, uh, we have the number of connections. We look at the potential demand, again, based on the line diameter, so slightly different. Um, we get the cost of the private fire and that's the additional capacity, again, just the standby capacity available. We have the customer service costs, same as potable. We have the cost of maintaining that meter, um, that tattletale meter. We add those three together and that's the cost for these um, individuals. So this um, fire lines hasn't been updated in a while. So um, this one has a little bit more of a dramatic change in it. It's less customers, but we wanna fine tune this, get this all straight and, um, and you know, clean up the house and just do good due diligence. Um, so that's what we're doing here. So we have the proposed, um, we have the current, and we have the changes. So there's a little bit more changes. Again, it's a small group of customers, mainly commercial um, establishments. So how does this all change? We've, you know, we've moved things around slightly. Um, and this is, what this, this is what this slide shows you. It shows you the per proposed and the current, again, collecting the same amount of revenue as 2020. We have the fixed charge slightly increasing by almost a little less than 200,000. Um, that uh, increase in private fire is decreasing by 184,000. And then the commodity, you just see a slight increase of $6,000 out of 77 million or 77.5 million. So once we've done the cost of service, and again, as I said, it's like that tune up of the tires, the alignment, then we add the 2% on top of that to get the proposed rates. So the proposed rates have a 2% in fiscal year 21 and 22, um, based on updated on the cost of service. And so what we have here is we have the current, here's the cost of service, and we just do the 2% on top of that. We do the same thing on the commodity. Again, we have the current cost of service and the 2% on top of that. And of course, we do the same thing on the private fire charge. So what's the impact to our customers and how does that affect? So we will, of course, wanna look at both residential and commercial. So residential, um, what we have here is we have um, this bi-monthly bill impact for someone who uses six, 12, 16, 23, 30, 50. So you have the different level of usages. We have the current bill, proposed bill. We have the dollar change, percent change. As you recall, this is a 2% increase in revenue, but this individual right here at the different level of usage don't see that really. They see less than 2%. So residential, um, single, most single family customers won't see that much of an increase. They'll actually see less than 2%. Of course, um, that is a zero sum game. So someone else has to see a slight increase and that's the commercial. And that's because the meter size cost has slightly increased for these individuals. And we're showing you different usages, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 CCF. Um, and you see the dollar change and the percent change. Um, again, I might, you know, it is what it is. So I'm going to stop there for a second before I go into stage rates, um, just to see if there's any questions Thank about you, that. Thank you, Mr. Gark. Um, any questions or comments from the directors on the presentation so far for Mr. Gark? I am not hearing any. I'll open up to members of the public. Do I have any questions or comments from the members of the public? If you wish to address the board or have a question, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or speak up if you are joining us on the phone. I have a hand, uh, Ken N, please. Thank you, uh, President Huang. Uh, let me lower my hand here. Yes, um, I have two comments. Uh, I guess one is a more general comment. I believe the uh, presentation on slide 13 uh, had sort of the underlying uh, working assumption or, or a process by this. And you know, this presentation is, uh, is entitled cost of service analysis. Yet it looks like the 
answer for the cost of service analysis was given up front. Uh, the answer had to turn out to be $116,776,764. Um, so it's not a bottoms up analysis of what does it cost to deliver water to a customer. It is, how do I figure out to back engineer the numbers such that the number, the total sum turns out to be $116,776,764. Put another way, if the district had collected a different amount of money in 2020, the target would have been different and the answer would have come out differently. Yet that doesn't really re relate to the true actual cost of service. So that's, that's one comment. The other comment has to do with uh, slide 18 and uh, following on Director Weed's comment about the cost of water. Yeah, so I am also trying to reconcile that number versus the number that was uh, presented by the same consultants uh, in their 2018 uh, water rate study, tables 4-5 and tables 4-6. Uh, table 4-6 in their 2018 water uh, was their water supply all-in costs. And uh, the, the all-in costs were approximately $34 million which is an interesting number because the district delivers 34 million gallons a day. So for $34 million, it delivers 34 million gallons a day. So that is a gallon a day uh, per dollar or 365 gallons per dollar and 748 gallons per unit. You do the math and it comes out to $2.05. So I'm trying to reconcile the $2.05 figure with the $2.98 figure. And the last comment related to that is that that water supply number, again, it seems to be an aggregate number. In table 4-5 of that same study, uh, the consultants demonstrate that there is a large variation in the, uh, the cost of the water, depending on whether it comes from, um, for example, the desal or SFPUC. And I believe that needs to be reflected into the, uh, the uh, cost of uh, service analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Kenan. I forgot to remind you and the rest of the members of the public, if they have question or wish to address the board, each person has a three minute limit and you just barely made it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gar. Um, so just a couple of comments. Um, so the definition of cost of service is correct, as um, Ken mentioned, um, but that's how we define cost of service. It's you want to collect this much amount of revenue how do you collect it? The financial plan addresses how much should you collect? So that's just the nature of the, of the terminology that we use in the industry. Um, so I think Ken's concerns more about the financial plan and about is $116 million appropriate? Um, and, and we would say yes, because that would meet the obligation of the district in its reserve targets, its funding, its, its financial strategy that it's trying to achieve. Um, then the question is how you collect it, and that's what this study does. Um, there might be some confusion with gallons and CCF. So these are all in CCF, not in gallons, and there's a note here. So there may be a little bit of a confusion there with that. Um, last time we did the study was in 2015. Um, I don't, maybe there was something we did in 20, I know we've done a lot of work with you, so I have to review and I'm not um, ready to talk about all the prior studies, but so we can get, address those concerns. I think I can kind of help a little bit with a couple of these things too, if you don't mind, Mr. Gar. Um, you know, and as you alluded to, that's kind of where the two percent increase proposals come into play, because because that's what the cost of service revenue requirement is. Then, if from the financial plan, we determine okay, what's the actual total amount of money we need, and that's where uh, either you know kind of an increase or decrease proposal would come from. And then the second thing on on this slide and that chart. Uh, I believe the tables uh, uh, that uh, Ken has referred to, they include operating costs, um, but the full cost of service or revenue requirement also includes a share of capital. And so it's, you know, kind of in my previous explanation of what's included in water supply here, I, I mentioned some of the operating costs, but of course uh, there's going to be a portion of capital related to water supply that's included as well. And so uh, I, I did fail to mention that earlier. 
Thank you, Mr. Wenderlich. Thank you, Mr. Gar. Do I have any other members of the public that has questions or wish to address the board? If you do, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or speak up if you're only joining us on the phone. And I am not seeing any hints or hearing any comments. Uh, Mr. Gar, please proceed with your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so now I want to talk about stage rates. Stage rates um, hopefully are never implemented, um, but these are an emergency that would occur um, either through a drought, a water shortage emergency, supply interruption from a natural disaster such as a fire or earthquake. And what, we're what the, the option here, what this is, is it's a financial tool just in case. Hopefully, again, we never need to use this, but it gives the board the flexibility to use it. So again, also the other thing to note is that the board may choose not to use it. So this gives an option for the board and the board will evaluate these different stages if they occur. Um, the board will require a 30 day customer notice prior to implementation. And again, as I mentioned, the goal of this is to maintain revenue stability for the agency during this crisis um, at, because of reduction in water sales due to a fire, natural disaster, et cetera. So through the urban water management plan, um, we have these different stages. Um, there are four stages and the stages have reductions associated with them, 10%, uh, 20%, 30%, and up to 50%. Those reductions would then have translate into a, a reduction in sales that are shown right over here. And what we want to do is, is we want to understand What's the financial risk? And this is what Director Weed's comment was concerned about is what if we had a stage two um, drought, another 20% reduction, we had to sell this much amount of water, what would that do to the district? And so what we do is, is we look at the raw, lost revenue and sales. There is a minor reduction in cost. So we wanna take that into account just to be cost of service to be very proper. So we look at the reduction in sales that you have from a purchased water. We look at the estimated savings and then we have that incremental cost. And again, the board can decide um, if they adopt these and today we're not adopting them, we're just considering them, we're looking at them. But at that public hearing, if the board does adopt it, then they can use those in future meetings or future, excuse me, droughts or stages. So what we have is we have these different stages, um, again, 10, 20, 30, and 50%. We have the unit rate, which we calculated right over here. And then this would be added on top of the proposed um, rates um, for 21 and 22 that are shown right over here. So one of the things about stage rates or sort of the discussion is what does this mean to my, as a customer? I asked to cut back, how does that affect my bill? So what we show you here, there's a lot of information here, but I want us to walk through this. But first, let's focus on this chart right here. Um, this is the current bill, 16 CCF. $130 and 15 cents is what they're currently paying right now. Now with this um, implementation of the 2% increase in the cost of service, we have this rate right here, $131 and 70 cents. So pay a dollar and some change extra. That's shown right over here. Now we're in a stage two drought. This person did not cut back their water use. So they're still using 16 CCF. And so they would pay more through the drought surcharge, it would be actually almost $150. But what if that person actually did follow the 20% reduction and said, okay, I am gonna, the district asked me to cut back, I'm gonna do my job, I'm gonna cut back by 20%. What will happen to my bill? Will I actually have to pay more? Um, well, this person actually will pay $131.25. So the bill to compare is this bill right here versus the proposed bill without the drought. And as you can see, they're very similar. Actually, I see a slight decrease, um, but basically it's the same bill. So the, the nice thing here, a nice message here is, is that if you do, um, if we have a drought, we ask you to cut back. And if you do um, cut back, you should not see an increase in your bill. Your bill should be roughly the same as it was under normal conditions. Again, this is a temporary thing and it wouldn't be something, it's just you turn on and off just during these emergencies. Is there any questions about this before I go to the next steps? Hi, this is John Weed. Mm -hmm. uh, first comment and then a suggestion. 
the reason for stage rates is the extraordinary disconnect between our variable cost and our variable income, our marginal cost and variable income. Um, but, and we need, and unfortunately, because we, we are so disconnected, we need to be able to make these adjustments. 336% difference. What's interesting is we're structured to make a lot of money when we have increased sales. But we've not talked about a stage rates when we have extraordinary income coming in. And we've benefited from that in the last two years with remarkable net income, $45 million two years ago, $55 million to the positive over budget in the last year on a $150 million budget. These are extraordinary disparities for a public utility. And that is it reflects the instability. So if we were to follow the same philosophy, would we not want to have stage rates for to um, reduce the cost of water when we have extraordinary sales? And in some sense, you already implicitly have that because what's happening is, is that the revenue that's getting generated is going into your fund balance, into your reserves. And so that's why now we're looking at uh, just a minor increase of 2%. Um, and, you know, and, and so in some sense, uh, you know, that's why even with these stage rates, when a, a drought occurs, you may not even implement them because you have the money, the reserves in the bank to weather through that. Yeah, we're flush. That's it. So we're in a good position. Thank you. And, and I would say that's your leadership. I mean, that's, you've, you've done a good job. You're in a good position and, you know, and, and that's where you want to be, right? Because we don't want to be in a situation where if something goes wrong, then all of a sudden we really have to ask people to cut back. And, that, and as we all know in 2015, I don't think none of us wants to live that experience again. No, I'd say we've had the good fortune of having some wet years. And unfortunately we're going into the driest three months of the start of a wet year in history. So we'll see what, that, what we run into. Thank you, Director Wee. Any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, actually, I have a question, more procedural. So the, the stage rates, we did uh, approve them in the last 218. Is there an expiration uh, on, on that approval? Do we have to re-up that every, uh, every couple of years or so? Or is that... Uh, in place until we actually call it into uh, into effect. Yeah, so I think I should take that one. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as staff went back through and reviewed exactly what was on the 218 notice last time and, and what exactly was in the resolution adopted by the board, uh, instead of saying the stage rates were effective as of a certain date, which is our typical uh, language that we use with rates, uh, we, we kind of showed them as applying to certain fiscal years. And so uh, unfortunately the stage rates will be sunsetting. And so uh, the next time we go through a rates process, uh, whether that's uh, right now, depending on the board action this evening or subsequently, uh, we will have to uh, approve stage rates if we want to kind of keep that tool available to us during a water shortage emergency. Uh, you know, having said that, uh, should the board decide not to move forward tonight, uh, we could always, if we do find ourselves in the off chance we find ourselves in an emergency situation, could come back at that time to reinstate stage rates. So it's not, you, you know, so I, I don't want to like imply that it must be done tonight. Uh, you know, one of the things that we'll get to is with any of these adjustments, and it's probably on Sanjay's next slide, you provide a 30 day notice to customers before you actually implement them anyway, once you make a decision, once you declare the water shortage emergency. Well, a 218 notification timeline is 45 days, right? So, so kind of from a timing perspective, there's not necessarily um, a huge difference there. Okay, and when are, when are these current stage rates sunsetting? Is it uh, the end of the fiscal year? Uh, yes. Thank you, Director Akbari. Any other questions or comments from the directors? 
I am not hearing any. Do I have any questions or comments from members of the public on the state rates? If you wish, if you have any questions or comments, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or speak up if you are only joining us on the phone. I am not seeing any. So thank you, Mr. Gar. Please proceed. Sorry about the little noise in the background, if you hear it. Um, next steps is um, receive input from the board. Um, we like to send out the Prop 218 notice so we can set the public hearing for February 11th um, and to get people informed about this. Okay. Thank you. Um, sorry. I I just, that concludes, concludes my presentation. All right. So directors, questions, comments? Uh, John Weed, I'll make the, director we continue to beat the horse. Um, the structure we have now, um, let me give you a, a, I, I, I support full funding for the district and adequate funding, secure funding. I'm concerned of the lack of, of stability and the incredible disconnect between marginal uh, income and marginal revenues. But let me give you a quick example. We just recently approved a $50 million AMI project. And part of the justification was we were going to have a 5% conservation. Well, we, in 5% conservation, we will avoid a million dollars in cost of the $21.5 million of annual cost of variable um, cost for water power and chemicals. But we're going to lose $4 million in revenue. So rather than having this reduction to 11 year payback, we're actually adding $3 million a year in lost revenues to that cost. And when you do the offset of the $4 million in lost revenues with $1 million in avoided cost, you have a net loss to the district when you conserve of $3 million. You add that $3 million over 20 years, you've more than doubled the cost of the AMI program to well over $100 million. That is how dysfunctional this rate structure we have is and how it really makes the lack of rationality hurt you. You cannot do budgeting and you cannot do a reasonable conservation program because it hurts you. You're, you ironically structured something where you want to sell as much water as you can and make these extraordinary profits. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Weed. <laughs> if I if I may just comment here quickly, I think you need to go back to the uh, uh, return on investment analysis that was presented to the board, because uh, those calculations of water conservation were taken into account in the business model. And so we still had a, a very uh, robust uh, return on investment <clears throat> and a very robust uh, internal rate of return as well. Uh, and all of that was factored in. And so I would say, go back to Mr. Stevenson and, and go review uh, that analysis I came in on my own one day and sat down with uh, Mr. Shaver, uh, Jonathan Wonderlick, and, and Mr. Stevens to go through that, uh, all of the foundation behind that analysis. And so um, you're picking out something in isolation without factoring in all of the other benefits that accrue to putting in AMI. There may well be other benefits, but unfortunately, as I pointed out at the time, that cost that analysis only looked at the co avoided cost side and did not address the revenue. As with the same issue when we looked at our overall conservation program, we only looked at the overall, we did not look at the loss. I, I, really, I would really, beg, I would really beg to differ with you and follow up with staff so you can go back through those. Thank you, Director Wee. Thank you, Director Sethi. Thank you for your clarification, Director Sethi, and thank you for your example, Director Wee. Definitely there are difference in opinion here, but I would like us to focus back on this agenda item. 
So any other questions or comments from the board? If not, I have a few. Okay, I, I have a question. Um, I'm the one who came up with 2%. What if we do zero and 3% when we come back the following year in our planning? Um, I was in a rather uncomfortable position. I wanted to do zero last time, but I was in the middle of an election and it didn't look good. It looked bad. And so I went to two and I'm looking at the numbers and Director Weeds even said it, we're flush. Um, and so if what would happen if we did a zero, three, um, and we get ourselves off of the election cycle with our rates, I'm worried that we lose the staged rates because I personally like the stage rate concept. If we need it, we have it. We've only needed it really once since I've been here and we had to dig it up, we had to do it because of the major drought. And I'm concerned it's dry this year, but what happens if we were to do a zero one, or zero, excuse me, not zero, zero three. We put off this rate increase for one year and we come back, we move the rates out of the election year cycle, we come back at three instead of two. Well, Jim, uh, this is Paul, and, and I would just like to, offer this for your consideration. Um, and I say this from a lot of experience with uh, working with our financial model. When you give up uh, the 2% in the first year, that 2% follows through in every subsequent year. And the 2-2 compounded flows through in every subsequent year. So if you take a look at the uh, financial planning model that was presented at the beginning of this item, 5.9, uh, you will see that by uh, the middle of the decade, we actually are running short in terms of covering our depreciation costs. We're going into the negative, We're covering our, our operating expenses, but not uh, the, the depreciation. So it would actually make the latter years of this decade uh, uh, worse off than what was presented tonight. Thank you and for your point the, of view, Director Seppi, but I think staff should answer that question. Sure, so I think um, certainly uh, Director Seppi's point is, is, is absolutely correct that the 2% compounds throughout you know, the next many years of the financial model. Um, so it certainly uh, would create some pressure for the increase to be slightly larger uh, next year, maybe something more than 2% if we were to forgo an increase this year. Again, at two years at 2% per year, uh, that's not, uh, those aren't really big numbers, right? So, so if you did have to add another percent or two onto a future increase, um, that, that's not too significant. So, you know, I guess, uh, but to look at it in a couple of different ways, you know, what staff has identified really is the additional funding from the first 2% increase is really dedicated to accelerating the pension and OPEB liability payoffs. And so I think if the, if the board were to choose not to move forward with the rate increase, um, staff would interpret that as also not accelerating the pay down of those liabilities. Uh, and that's where the, the difference would come in and then we would resume a financial planning effort with the board uh, probably late uh, in next summer and into the fall uh, to then you know kind of reconvene and figure out what the priorities are across the board with our finances and what type of rate increase would be required to accomplish those priorities. Uh, in terms of the stage rates, uh, yes, uh, we would end up with a certain amount of time without having them in effect. Uh, but we do have strong reserves right now, and uh, I, I believe those reserves are more than sufficient to see us through a process if we did have kind of a sudden need to go through a process to reinstate those stage rates. So I, I don't see um, losing those for a few months uh, as a big problem. Thank you, Mr. Wenderlich. Um, any other questions from the board? If not, I will ask my question. Director Akbari, do you have any questions for 
Not a question, just a clarifying comment on uh, what Mr. Wunderlich said, just for the benefit of the public here. The acceleration on the OPEB uh, and the, the liability payoffs, we're, we're already working on an accelerated timeline to, to, pay the, to pay down those liabilities. What we're looking at right now is accelerating the accelerated timeline. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify that because I don't want anyone to think that we're not uh, we're not taking that that portion seriously, and, and that we're not doing that advanced funding that we had uh, that we've been discussing for a couple of years now. No, that, that's absolutely <laughs> correct. So a few years ago, uh, the board put us on a 15-year schedule uh, to get those liabilities paid off, and that 15-year end date is June 30 of 2032. Uh, that's uh, faster than Calpers requires us to get fully caught up. Uh, they typically now. Uh, put you on a 20 year schedule is, is their standard current policy. So we're, we're well ahead of that schedule. And uh, the funding uh, from the 2% increase that's in front of the board for consideration would allow us to accelerate that payoff date by two years. And if I may add to that and uh, Director Akbari's comments, uh, as was shown in the presentation, um, with the 2% rate increase that we would put into effect in the first year, we get the benefit of uh, the, uh, the added acceleration on, on paying down our unfunded liabilities here. But uh, uh, Jim, uh, Director Gunther, it, it shows that we end up with $10 million of net savings over the next, uh, between now and 2030, if we follow through with a 2% a uh, 2%, 2% rate increase. And so I would encourage us to stay on track with that. Otherwise, as Mr. Wunderlich pointed out, we really forego that uh, accelerated payment. Thank well, you. I, guess, I guess that's one of my questions is, do we know what that impact would be if we went zero and then three? Um, because I did see that $10 million number and I do understand the, the compounding effect. Um, and part of that would be a going rather than a two, two would be a zero, three, um, or zero, then three, three. Um, that's kind of what I was talking about. Thank or, you, Director. Or zero, four for that. Okay. Um, Perhaps. <laughs> All right. So, Director, we, and then I would like to ask my question. So, Please your talk question. The term acceleration may give the wrong implication. We're in an extraordinary deficit and CalPERS and OPEP. We're not even within the 80%, 120% uh, corridor. We're below 80%, which is minimal. At one time, we had a surplus. 2003, we, were, we didn't think we'd have a problem. We were at 2008, and we dropped down with almost 50% funding. We're struggling to get back up. So acceleration means we're just trying to catch up to and fill a huge deficit. And to the extent that we can pay up, start paying up that deficit, it'll give us a level of stability and would also even further improve our bond rating with Moody's, which does take into account legacy costs. S&P doesn't. Thank you, Director Wee. So my questions. Um, first of all, I see based on our rate study, we need to make minor adjustments to meter charges and all that. Will that require 218 to put those in place? Yes, so if we were to make the adjustments from the cost of service study, um, even without doing a rate increase, that would require a, a 218 process. Okay. So, so my recommendation, should the board uh, decide not to move forward with the rate increase, would be that we also defer implementing updates from the cost of service analysis until the following year. And we are, uh, it is, and this is probably a question for council, um, and that, is that okay to defer that adjustment now that we have a rate study? Yes, Proposition 218 only applies to new or increased rates and charges. And so if you don't do anything, uh, then it wouldn't trigger Proposition 218. Okay, even though we have a rate study that says we need to make an adjustment? Yeah, I think deferring it one year, if that's what the board chooses to do, um, would be okay from a legal perspective. You have the analysis, we would implement it, 
in a short period of time and at the time we we're going to do a rating fee. So if that's the board's policy decision, I think it'd be fine from a legal perspective. Okay. Yeah. The other thing related to this I would mention is that state law requires us to do a cost of service study at least once every 10 years. Our most recent one at this point is still only five years old, so, so it is still valid under the state legal requirement uh, for now. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to open the floor up to our customers uh, if they wish to address the board or provide any comments to the board, and then I will come back to the board for final discussions and comments. So this way we will, if we could take in account our customers' thoughts and recommendations. So at this point, if there are any members of the public or customers that wish to address the board on the proposed increases, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or speak up. We are only joining us by phone. Ugh, I see one hand. Can Ann, please speak up. Yeah, members of the board, uh, this is a good discussion. Um, I think the real question is, what is, you know, we are in unprecedented times. There are s serious issues of affordability, temporary uh, issues of affordability. Um, many of your uh, sister agencies have deferred their rate increases. Uh, I do understand the financial benefits of accelerated pay down of a pension obligation. Uh, I believe Director Gunther has proposed zero slash three instead of two slash two uh, to partially make up and perhaps even zero slash four. Um, I, I, I would implore the board to think carefully about what does it take to forego the rate increase this year, either what is the increased rate increases that would be necessary in the following year or following two years, and or uh, as I have mentioned in previous board meetings, explore the possibility of refinancing um, some of your obligations because the disparity between the discount rate and the prevailing uh, interest rates to borrow money is fairly, fairly wide. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, do I have any other members of the public that wish to address the board? If you have questions or comments for the board, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or speak up your, if you're only joining us by phone. I am not seeing any questions or comments or raise hands. So I'm going to bring this back to the board. So directors, this is your chance to comment. Um, who wants to start? Well, I guess I'll start. Um, I was a swing vote in the last meeting and I, it was uncomfortable um, because I was in the middle of an election and I didn't wanna be looked at as trying to buy votes, which was quite a true statement. Um, it could have been read that way. And it was somewhat of a difficult election. But one of the things in that election was that 51,000 people voted for former Director Kohler, who was running on a platform that all that we've done is increased rates over the past many years. I had some difficulty with his platform, but still, nonetheless, it was a true statement. Um, Ramesh Gopalan got 42,000 votes. Um, 42,000 compared to our lead candidate, Aziz Akbari, who got 65, but still 42,000 people basically were saying voting for the other guy. And his primary thing was this constant rate increase. And I understand it's 2%. I mean, I really, and I see the value in that 2%, but there's perceptions and I really also see a real value in moving it off of the election cycle. Um, I'd be very much in favor of a zero coming back at a three, not even a two. I don't wanna see a two. Uh, we were initially talking about three and three and I asked for a four and something I think it was, I think it was a three, but I said, look, can we drop it to two? And I would prefer if we can come back with zero and three. 
I know we're going to lose some money off of that accelerated payment. I don't have that figure in front of me tonight, but if we go zero three, it won't be that. Now, if we go zero four, um, I don't know. It depends on what's going on. Hopefully next year, we'll be a little bit out of where we are today. COVID is still a problem. It's not going away right now. Um, I really don't like losing that staged rate concept, um, but I guess we could live with that if, if it's necessary. Um, because I fully support those. And I wish there was a way if the next time we go through that, I'm gonna push for those that we see if there's a way we can leave them in effect in a Prop 218 notice that they just kind of are there. Uh, because we're not voting on them. We have to bring them in, we have to adopt it. It's just an emergency. It's a strange situation. I don't know if 218 will let us do that, but you know, we could see. Um, so, I would like to go zero, three. I know we're not voting on three tonight. If we did that, if we deferred, but that's kind of where I'd like to go. Thank you, Director uh, Gunther. John Weed, if I could. Director Weed. We've used the term election cycle. We set up a program that we're following now, which gives us a rate discussion following the election, realizing it's a two year cycle. And we have a two year budget a major improvement over what we had historically. We violated that practice this last uh, a couple of months ago when we had a rate workshop immediately before an election. That was in total opposition to what we had previously determined was good uh, government guidance and good practice to not to try to influence our rates and financing of the district to try and uh, garner some votes for the near term. The second year is the election year. So when you talk about the second, putting 3% in the second year, that comes in March shortly and reasonably time before the election. It is putting it into the election cycle. So it, the logic is not there. I would hope we go with the two and two. The um, covering our legacy cost is a dire need for this district. We have an extraordinary uh, obligation that we've not met. It's been one of our major failures over the last uh, 15 years and one that we need to address now. So um, we're on track if we can expedite it. The fact other districts have been able to pay up their old PEB entirely. We're not one of them. Even though we've had good years, let's focus on getting OPEB up to the bar. Is that even more than CalPERS? Is our responsibility. Thank you, Director Wee. Director Sapi, do you wish to speak? Uh, yes, I, I back up Director Wee's comments entirely in, in their entirety. Um, uh, and I, I, I say this very kindly to Director Gunther. Uh, we are off in the off election cycle right now. If we go through a rate increase in March of 2022, um, and I don't know if it's going to be three or four percent at that point in time. Uh, then we've we've put our rate increase right into play in the election year, just three or four months before people file. I am in favor of staying the course, uh, sliding rate increases um, equitable from year to year, two percent, two percent. Let's get our unfunded liability paid down here. There's a real cost savings to our, our rate payers if we, if we have that 2% right now, as the staff is pointing out. And let's also take into consideration the fact that with the uh, rate study that uh, we've paid for, um, you know, we pay, for, we pay a good consulting cost to have this kind of study done that what Mr. Sanjay Gore is pointing out is that on the five eighths and three quarter inch meters, which are majority of our residential customers, they actually see a, a little bit of a, a there, it's less than 2% rate increase. It's closer to 1%. And, 
and so it it's the other accounts that are paying for the two percent rate increase and please remember one third of our revenue comes from commercial in, uh, industrial institutional one third of our revenue so yes i i watch closely the election results too um obviously there are people that are concerned about our past rate increases but i think modest rate increases of two percent two percent and and helps us to get our unfunded liabilities paid down earlier with a, a greater than 10 million dollar cost savings from that payment we would make this year <clears throat> is prudent financial management and i've always preached revenue uh stability revenue reliability and our staff relies on that as well in all of their planning purposes. And uh, if we don't do this 2% rate increase the first year, 2%, 2%, as I said, it flows through at the back end of the decade, uh, we're not covering our depreciation costs in the district. We're only covering operational costs. And I was originally in favor of 3%, 3%, uh, as the staff originally recommended, over the next 10 years because that would cover all operating costs plus your depreciation expense. So uh, we're, we're going to have to rectify that down the road. That That's not going to disappear. And that was kind of the standard that we met the last few years was to cover, have our water sales cover all of our operating costs plus depreciation. It took us a decade to get to that level. Of, 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 of achieving that the last three years. And now we're going into reverse if, if, we, if we go with a zero rate increase. And so I, I highly encourage us for sound financial reasons, let's get out of the election cycle. Let's do the two year Prop 218. And then we don't have to address it with a Prop 218 at the beginning of 2022, which is the election year. So uh, I want to thank Mr. Gore for uh, your presentation. I also enjoyed uh, what you presented at Aqua. And uh, um, I, I, would, I would encourage, I don't want to say insist, but I encourage us to please do the rational thing and uh, leverage the study that was just completed and get ourselves out of the election cycle so we don't have to go to the public spring of 2022. And, and um, Director Wong and I, if we choose to run, we'll be up for election that year. So um, if we get it done right now, we won't have to come back and do this until the end of uh, 2022 after the election. Thank you, Director Sethi. Um, Director Akbari? Uh, well, my position hasn't changed from, from the last meeting. I still think that we should go with a 0% rate increase. Now, I do understand the benefit that we would get by uh, accelerating our, our payments on the unfunded liabilities. That That's certainly um, not lost on me here. Um, I, I am though comfortable with the current timeline up to 2032 that we have that we have laid out and I'm sure we'll have more opportunities uh, to, to find creative ways to continue to pay down our, our unfunded liabilities as well. Um, I, I think affordability has just been top of mind for a lot of our customers and it sets, uh, it sets a, a precedent that we are ignoring some of the concerns that they have by continuing with a rate increase, even when we know that uh, that that there are you know uh, many customers who who may not find that affordable. Uh, on top of that, yes, on the residential side, we're looking at a, something smaller than two percent, something between um, uh, I think zero point seven percent up to uh, about like one point seven percent on the commercial or sorry on the residential side. But on the commercial side, we're seeing a, a much steeper increase and. Uh, we know that local businesses, especially um, small businesses, 
uh, are having a, a difficult time and and um, you know adding this burden of a rate increase onto the onto their activities as well it, it's it's not good for our community in my opinion so I uh, I, I would prefer moving with the zero percent increase for one year. Um, the original presentation, I think back in October, that was presented to the board by district staff, uh, did show that we could uh, we could afford a zero percent increase and still maintain the three percent increases in the out years, um, and and still you know cover cover all of our our expenses. So uh, that's that's what I'm planning on sticking with tonight. Um, I understand some of the concerns about moving this out of an election year. Um, we do have an opportunity instead of doing a two year 218 of doing a one or a three year 218. So we can always adjust that uh, as well in uh, future Prop 218. So, uh, so I, I think that's, that's where I'm gonna land uh, tonight. Um, and you know, again, for the same reasons that I outlined in the last uh, the last board meeting when this came to us as well. Thank you, Director Akbari. Um, I do share your concern about affordability. Um, I think it was very clear at the last workshop that I am in favor of skipping a rate increase this year altogether. In fact, I am in favor of not having a rate increase this year and have staff present a new financial picture um, next summer sometimes when we understand the effect of all these late payments and the effect of COVID on our income stream. And then we could talk about how many years of 218 and what type of rate increase when we actually have a better financial picture. In terms of the 2% rate increase, I think it's very clear from staff's presentation that the 2%, majority of the 2% rate increase would, be go, would go to prepay our OPEP obligation. I see our OPEP obligation simplistically like a housewife, it's like a mortgage. It is always nice to prepay your mortgage to save on the interest. But when you are having issues paying your daily bill to make sure meals on the table, it makes no sense to prepay your mortgage and save on the interest. And that is a position a lot of our customers are in as evidence by the late bill payments. We have a lot of fixed income seniors. We have a lot of low income residents that's buried um, in different type of accounts. If you look at the per capita income in Newark, it's not, people think Fremont, New York Union City is an extremely wealthy area, it's not. We actually have a lot of people where increasing water bills will make a difference in their life's choices. We have people that are waiting for COVID stimulus money to make their ends meet, especially with the latest stay at home order. We'll have people that's out of job and yet we are being tone deaf and increasing their water rate just so that we could prepay our mortgage to save interest. It is definitely a very nice financial things to do for the district if we could afford it. At this point, we, our customers, are not able to afford it. I am going for, I will propose that we forego this rate increase, have staff come back next summer to present a new picture to us to help us understand what is the impact of COVID to our financial pictures in terms of our income stream. At that point, we could talk about the necessary rate increases and the number of years of Prop 218 we will be looking at. I would definitely prefer to take the rate increases outside the election cycle since Director Sethi is right, I will be up for election. But you know what? I will always vote for what I think is right for our customers. If it end up in my election cycle, so be it. And as a no director weed, we yeah. end up with a rate discussion in December through no fault of the staff. We, the directors, because of our schedule constraint, we ended up scheduled that meeting. I have, I have a question for, um, for legal counsel. <clears throat> Are we able to approve a two year Prop 218 notice right now where it would be zero and 3%? 
So um, that's a good question um, because you're, right now your financial analysis has a 2%, 2%. Um, and I don't know if your staff has handy a 0, 3% with all the financial implications of it. So you might need to bring that back at some point. But, yeah, could, I mean, we, but could we approve a two-year Prop 218 with something like 0, 3%? So, so we don't have to go through the exercise all over again next year. So tonight you're not taking action to, to approve any rate increase. You're taking action to set a public hearing, but what you do, do need to have available is the analysis. Um, you're, so tonight I would recommend that you not take that action um, until that analysis is done. Uh, and, and maybe the analysis has been done in the past, but I don't think it, it has been. Um, but could you technically take action to do no rate increase one year and then a some rate increase another year? Um, the answer is yes, um, but you don't need to take action on not taking any action <laughs> typically. And by the way, you can have a, a rate schedule that's up to five years if you wanted to. So you can have a, a, a lot of variety based on that. That's what the law is. Yeah, I, I don't want to put this into Director Sethi's schedule, um, election schedule, because I know how difficult it could be. It was in mine. Um, it was very clear and apparent that that everybody knew what we were talking about. So it was on the board. And um, there were statements being made that were very difficult. Um, I mean, I've, I, have vo I voted for the 100% service charge increase. I stand by my vote. Um, I voted for 25% or well, it was total 25 over two years. If you don't take into account the zero that we did the year before that, it wasn't quite that much, but I had to stand behind, I stood behind that vote too. I would like a zero three um, because one of the concepts I kept hearing over and over again is it's constant. It's always, always, always. They all forgot about that zero one year because we followed it with a 20%, with a 30%, which ended up being 25. Um, I, I really like the idea of zero three. Um, it, keep, it would keep us out of the election cycle, which is where I want to be is out of the election cycle. Um, so, so Director Gunther, let me interrupt you here um, based on what I heard from council. So staff, general managers, do you have the information for us, the financial picture for 03? Uh, we do not have a cost of uh, service study completed at this time. So I, I'd turn okay. this over to our manager of finance and, and our consultant to see what kind of schedule uh, would be required for that. And then general counsel may have some comments regarding um, the board setting a public hearing without having the analysis complete. Right. Yet. And, and, and I think that's what I'm hearing from council is that we need to have the analysis in place before we set the public hearing, correct? Mr. Miyaki? Correct. All right. All so, right. So, so to answer Director Gunther, you can't do a zero three without the analysis. Okay. Uh, John Wee, if I might. Director Wee. The pension obligations are a deficit. We're not prepaying. We're paying a legal obligation. We're, we're in deficit. We have a legal obligation that has not been filled. And we have a, a, a prolonged payment of it. If we were to pay it 100% tomorrow, we'd catch up. That would not be a prepayment. That would be paying our obligations uh, that, we, that we need and should do. One of the most inane decisions this board had made was the rate holiday a few years back. That led directly, in part because of the timing of the drought, to a, 25, a proposed 30% increase that we then settled on a 25% rate increase that sent this district into turmoil. The inability to set up a standard pattern, a cadence, I use the term at the time of the rate holiday, is a true failure of governance and leadership. Trying to react to emotions and what feels good, what we think right. Look at what's best to run a 
170, now $175 million business enterprise. And don't do it on feelings and emotion. Do it with rational economic decisions. And we're not with the last discussion we just had. And Director Lee, I will respectfully disagree with you. It's like a home mortgage. I owe the bank money for my house. I have agreed upon payment, which is what we have with OPEP, a scheduled payment. I could choose to pay early. So instead of 30 year mortgage, I will go down to 15 years. But if I cannot afford paying it down early, then I shouldn't. It's not and a graduate it's obligation. You know, yes. if I may just throw in a thought here, and I brought it up before. <clears throat> Every time, and I, I asked Director Gunther, please take this into consideration. Every time the district over the last 50, 60 years has gone through a zero rate increase for one year, it's come to bite the district back in the butt. And that's what happened when we did the rate holiday. And that's why we ended up with such a very large rate increase uh, over the subsequent years, because when you lose the benefit of the rate increase that we're doing right now, it flows through through all subsequent years. And even at 2%, 2% compounds over time uh, with the, the subsequent rate increases. And, you know, I'm a businessman. And I just think that you have to do the prudent uh, right things financially, what's financially sound for the district. And 2%, 2% meets our obligations. If we uh, back off from that, we're going to pay the price down the road. And uh, while I respect the uh, affordability arguments in the community, we did just recently raise our help on tap program up to $35. That's getting rid of a, a, of a majority of the uh, fixed service charge, the fixed costs, the service charge. And, uh, and we need to promote that better for the people that need it. But uh, remember most of this rate increase is not on the five eighths and three quarter inch meters. And I respect what Director Akbari said about uh, uh, the burden on small businesses, but small businesses don't uh, have the larger meters. They have standard residential size meters. If you're running a hair salon or a restaurant or anything like that. Uh, so, uh, you can factor out all of those small businesses that are out there. They're seeing less than a 2% rate increase, uh, according to Mr. Mr. Gar's uh, analysis. So uh, I can see we're split here. Uh, Director Gunther, with the benefit of the study that's been completed right now, uh, I would encourage us strongly to go forward with the 2%, 2% rate increase and take it out of an election year. And, and remember the burden on the staff, on hiring consultant, a consultant uh, in another year, and all of the time that it takes the board to discuss these issues. We've gone through several financial workshops this year uh, we've heard from the public, uh, and now I feel like the board is not stepping up to its responsibility to uh, get the job done for its uh, uh, district customers. Let's get the job done, and then that allows the board to put in and devote time to other large issues that are coming up in the next couple of years. We can't be debating this forever. And we're not going to save ourselves anything right now. We're not going to save anything for our customers if we have to come back next year and then try to meet our financial obligations by having 
let's say a 4% rate increase. It, it just is, um, uh, I, I'm really disappointed in the board, not the staff, that we cannot make proper financial sound decisions. We're running a business, an enterprise public business. Let's Thank act you. responsibly. Thank you, Director Sethi. Let me add quickly to this. We, we have identified 1,000 of our 85,000 customers that have an affordability issue. I was prepared to give them even more money. If the issue is affordability, identify those people that do have affordability issues and we can help them. And we can more, we can zero tier them if we were, if you charge them nothing and still meet the requirements because the cost was relatively modest. It was one eighth of 1% of our budget currently goes into help on tap. We could increase that tenfold and it would not be an issue. It would certainly be less than the rate increase we're talking about. But to try and warp an entire rate structure to try and help a little over 1% of our um, rate payers is not rational and it's not responsible. I thank you, Director Wee, for your comment. I would just like to say that I will remind the board directors, please do not get personal or use adjectives that imply personal opinions of other directors. Please stay professional. We have very different opinions and I actually think that's the strength of this board, just precisely because we are so different. So I would ask for respect. What I'm going to say is that we made a commitment to our customers that we collect what we need, not what we would like to have. That is the agreement with our customers. It does not make sense to me personally that we would collect money that is nice to have, which is pay down the OPEP liability earlier. We should consider our customers wants and needs in our decision. If we are a private business, I totally agree with the directors, Weed and Sethi, but we're not. We're a water agency, we're a public agency. We are elected board for a reason to represent our customers. So with that, I think we have reached an impasse. I don't believe any further discussion would move us for, uh, forward. So I'm actually going to ask- I, 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 wanna, I wanna throw in one last comment. Yes, With uh, about 8,000 rate protests that we had in the last uh, two uh, rate hearings for the district, 90% of the customers who were complaining, and we mapped it out, were the highest wealth, highest income people in our community. That's a fact that the that ninety percent were of the highest income groups in our community, and that's where I directly hear complaints from people. And I'm in agreement with Director Director Weed. We we're spending a, a tiny fraction of one percent on our help help on tap program, and we have more than enough funds to expand that program. And and we're we're thinking about this in the wrong way. The two percent rate, two percent, two percent affects all of our customers. One third of our revenue comes in from commercial, industrial, institutional, and that revenue hasn't disappeared. We've actually seen an increase in revenue during COVID nineteen during the drought. You look back every month in our board packet right now, and water demand has gone up not down. So let's think about things rationally here. And if we need to provide some benefit to small businesses, then let's set up a separate workshop where we think creatively and, and uh, uh, have a, um, a brainstorm session, invite in the business community, the Chamber of Commerce and others to say, oh, how can we help you out? What would benefit you? And then let's come up with a program like we did with Help on Tap to directly target those customers. I'm a product manager 
by background, no matter what title I've ever held. I'm a product manager at heart. And you don't price your product uh, uh, for, for your entire market. You segment your market. And uh, so if you're selling Campbell soup, you don't set your mar uh, market price at what you're going to be selling at, at the, at the uh, lowest income community. You segment your, your, your market and you price it accordingly. And if you have to offer coupons or rebates or incentives to get people to buy in quantity, like at Costco, you do that. But you don't price Campbell Soup at the same price at Safeway. And uh, I don't think that we're actually thinking like sound business people right now. And Can again, I, I see the board is divided, and I'm going to invite Director Gunther. I plead with you. Think about the overall picture here. Uh, and let's get this out of the way for the next two years so we can focus our energies on uh, other issues for the district and for the benefit of our customers. If we need to come up with a special program to help out people at the low end of the market, whether it's uh, business or, or residential, then let's do that separately. So I just wanna say that we're not a private business, we're a monopoly. Our pricing is very different. We do not have the market force to help us narrow down to a, a, a pricing category like That's Kibble. absolutely not true, Director. We are Martin. a monopoly. It's absolutely Director not Stanley. true. And you we can are see a monopoly. You can see, we're, we're a public enterprise, but you can see it from the study that Mr. Gore has provided us with tonight that we already are segmenting our market by meter size, by market, uh, so you don't price your product at the at at the lowest segment of your market that you that uh, you're serving. You you address that portion of your market and address those needs that other ways. Do not offer coupons. Our help on tap funds. What do you think help on tap is? Help on tap is like a is yes, a, but the funds are very limited. We cannot use our water rate, so our ability to offer uh, your coupon is very limited. We have a, more than enough money right now to double the size of the program. Okay. I am going to bring us back because we I, have I, non -water, I have we have non-water revenues. We have non-water revenues right now that are more than ample that are not being used. And those, and we can use that revenue. If there is a motion, since we have beat this one to death, is there a motion on the table? What so would be the nature council, of the motion? Pardon? What, what, is the motion simply to call a public hearing? We need to take no action this evening. So we were told by the attorney just recently. Just if you want a 218 hearing, you need to set the 218 hearing. If we don't take a motion, that means there will not be a 218 hearing. I just so, want to be very fair and clear well, to the director. We're not deciding the, uh, the, the rate increases tonight. No, but you need to set a 218 hearing with a proposed rate. Council, is that correct? So if the board wants to go forward with a rate increase, you would need to set the public hearing and authorize the, um, the sending of the 218 notice, which is required under Proposition 218 that gives notice of the proposed rate increase. And so that's the, that's the action the board would need to take tonight if it wanted to proceed with um, the rate increase. So I will make a motion on item 5.9 to set a public hearing uh, for a proposed rate increase of 2% for the, the next 2% uh, 2% uh, 2 for March 1 of next year and March 1 of 2022. Uh, and that, that we consider that at that public hearing. 
I will second that motion with a note that this only al allows us to make a uh, increase of 2% on each of the years, doesn't mandate that we do so. Yeah, that, that would be the, according to Prop 218, that would be the maximum that we could set the rate at. So we have a motion by Director Seppi, and we have a second by Director Wee, Ms. Marco, Roko. Director Zakbari? Nay. Gunther? No. Sethi? Yes. Weed? Director Weed? Sorry. Aye. And Director Juan? No. So with that, um, General Manager, Council, we need directions. So I since there's the motion did not pass, that means we will not have a 218 hearing. And I assume staff will come back to us at some point to talk about year two and financial pictures. Is that correct? So um, it is correct um, that staff will not mail out Prop 218 notices. Okay. As uh, we, we were planning on doing. Um, so uh, in terms of coming back to the board, uh, to discuss rates. Uh, the calendar that you adopted this evening has a potential uh, number of uh, workshops that we could do that. Uh, the calendar currently has uh, rates related financial workshops scheduled in August, September, and October, but that does not preclude uh, staff from, you know, scheduling additional special board meeting workshops should the board uh, direct us to do so. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shaver. And with that, I would say we move on unless directors have the alternate proposals, which I don't think we could have one since this is a yes, yes or no uh, item. President Wong, if, if I may. Um, really? there, there are actually a couple of more slides in the staff presentation. Uh, I'd like to hand it back to Mr. Alm at this stage. <laughs> Uh, because there were a few slides remaining pertaining to miscellaneous fees and charges. Uh, those are not subject to 218. Okay. And so based on the discussion this evening, uh, I'll ask Mr. Alm to forego the recommendation slide, mm -hmm. but if you could just briefly cover the miscellaneous fees and charges, and then the plan would be that we would still come back to the board uh, if, likely in February and ask the board to adopt the updates to these fees. All right. Okay. My apologies, Mr. Wong. Not a problem. Thank you, President Wong and Mr. Wanderig. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, get to our next section of the presentation. Um, this is regarding the miscellaneous uh, rates and charges. Um, staff has reviewed uh, the relevant cost data uh, for other miscellaneous fees and charges um, based on the review. Uh, staff is proposing additional um, uh, revision to the uh, rate and fee schedule. Um, what you see here um, on the chart um, are proposed, uh, the proposed uh, charges, and they're all uh, to cover the cost of service. Um, most adjustment um, in, the, in the top section there are, are pretty minor. Um, this is really just to reflect the, uh, a little slight increase in um, and labor costs. For the meter installation charges, however, there's um, noticed um, more significant increases. And this is primarily due to uh, replacing the current meters with the ultrasonic meter. Um, just as an example, uh, the 3 4 inch meter uh, cost goes from $88 to $161, uh, or an increase of $73. So uh, the majority of that of the increase for the meter installation charges uh, for the um, actual cost of the meter itself. Um, the, the, the charges as indicated there are the proposed fees and, and rates uh, are effective uh, March 1, 2021, except uh, the meter installation uh, charges uh, would be effective uh, May 1, uh, 2021. Um, this is um, just to remind the board, uh, in April of uh, 
on the matter of February of 2019, uh, the board approved the update to the, the uh, facility connection charges uh, with a five-year phase in um, that included the equity buy-in component. Um, this would be the third year of the phase in, um, which scheduled to go into effect May 1, uh, 2021, uh, with an inflationary increase of 4.479% uh, by the, the increase in the um, engineering news record construction cost index. Uh, the inflation, inflationary adjustment uh, was authorized uh, by the board in 2019. Um, so a letter would go out to the developers um, sometime in early uh, calendar year in January of 2021. Uh, John Weed, if I can make a quick comment. Sure. Uh, when this came up for the Finance Committee, the issue was raised, we're going to be doing a major AMI program and replacing uh, 65,000 residential meters and modifying others. Uh, but if we encounter issues such as a damage ankle stop in that process, I would hope that we could look into the program and not charge the resident an additional $304 uh, if we need to do additional repairs and, uh, and work at the meter assembly, and I would that would be, and that would be a, have to be a separate action, I believe, by the board. And but I would encourage us to look at that as a way that we would not um, generate additional fees on the part of a uh, rate payers that are discovered in the process of AMI. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wee. Thank you for the comment. Um, so, staff is also proposing to, to add the high efficiency toilet rebate uh, for the multifamily residential properties. Um, the rebate is $70 per high efficiency toilet uh, for replacing a high volume toilet with efficiency toilet. Um, the rebate is already available for uh, the district's uh, non-residential customers. Uh, another quick point. When this came to us, I pointed out that we're talking multifamily, but you really mean master metered residential units as opposed to multifamily um, residential units. That is correct. Thank you for clarification. Um, so that concludes my presentation on the miscellaneous fees. Um, I will pause here for any questions on those before I get to the next steps. Any questions or comments from the board? I'd like to follow up quickly on the master meter issue. And I think there's an opportunity, particularly in the, um, to look at a special rate structure for master metered residents uh, units that would be allow us to address um, the needs of the economically disadvantaged in those uh, units, either through sub metering or some other mechanism. And that I think is the uh, fertile ground for um, equity uh, water rates, rather than trying to redo an entire rate structure. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wee. Um, any other questions or comments from the directors? I'll just make a, a quick comment that I, I do concur with uh, Director Weed's uh, first comment about um, potentially offsetting um, the, uh, the charge for damage angle for uh, customers as we're going through the AMI process. And, and uh, agreed with him at the finance committee meeting as well when, when uh, the idea was brought up. So, and, and I can uh, I can let you know that certainly that message was shared with Mr. Stevenson uh, following the committee meeting. And uh, certainly we'll see what can reasonably be accomplished uh, with the contractor, You know what else they can do while they're out there replacing all those meters. Uh, in regard to the damaged angle stops though, I can tell you the current practice right now is when a meter reader identifies one, they enter a code into their handheld device that triggers a service order. And so there is already routine uh, maintenance uh, on those items. So uh, I wouldn't expect uh, our AMI contractor to encounter that very often. Thank you, Mr. Wendelick. Um, any other questions or comments from the directors? Any questions or comments from members of the public? If you have any questions or comments, please raise your hand in the Zoom app or speak up if you're joining us on the phone. 
I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Please proceed. Thank you, President Wong. Uh, just um, so I'll skip this uh, recommendation. Um, next step, just a couple of dates here. Um, the March 1, 2021 would be the effective date um, for the miscellaneous uh, fees and charges, as I mentioned. Uh, May 1, 2021 would be the effective date for uh, the development related fees and charges. Um, again, as Mr. Wong mentioned, it does not require a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Rome. And just for the record and the recording, we will not be implementing bullet one, two, three on that slide, correct? And um, Mr. Rome, uh, Mr. Wunderlich, to implement the, um, the miscellaneous fees and charges, when would we expect, we would need board action to do that, correct? Correct. So we will bring a resolution for the board to consider at the February meeting for the to update the rate and fee schedule for the miscellaneous fees and charges, as well as to update the rate and fee schedule for the development related fees and charges. Uh, that does not require a 218 notice, that does not require public hearing, it's, it's just kind of a normal action item for the board. And so we'll bring that back in February. Okay, and uh, this is a question for the entire board. Um, when we do that, would you like some sort of uh, press release about the district foregoing a rate increase? Um, you know, uh, so that the the public is aware that that didn't occur. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm looking for nods. It doesn't require board action. I see only one nod. I'll be honest, I'm a little bit neutral on that idea. Um, not, <coughs> uh, I think it would just depend on, on how, on, on kind of the... <coughs> okay, so what we'll do is we'll think about it as staff and uh, we'll consult with the um, LICA committee. Yeah. All right. I would um, suggest that we do put out a press release consistent with the other agencies from around the Bay Area that have indicated a deferral of uh, uh, or postponement of rate increases. Right. And, uh, we, and we do need to keep the public informed as to what we're doing. And my thinking is um, it would be a balanced message that acknowledges the unprecedented time that we're in now, but also is realistic that it is a deferment. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's still, there will likely have to be made up for at some point in the future. So staff will think about it. Um, and like I said, we'll work with the LICA committee on that. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. So with that, I think this concludes this item 5.9, correct? Yes. So I will pull the board. Would you like a break? Yes. All right. So why don't we take a break until it's what my clock is saying, 917? Shall we, we come back at 930? Yes. Thank you very much. So we'll adjourn till 930. So let's see, next item would be report 6.1 is board committee reports. Do I have any questions from the directors on any of the committee re board committee reports? Going once, going twice. No. Hearing none, do I have any comments on item 6.2 operational reports from the directors? Questions? Harness report looks really good. 150 was the highest one uh, and over in Union City. Um, so yeah, everything was below 150 except for one reading. Real, real good. Thank you, Director Gunther. Any other questions or comments from the directors on 6.2? No. Hearing none, let's move on to item 6.3, staff presentation. 631 is state legislation year end report by JGC Consulting. And thank you, Jonathan and Aaron, for being so patient. 
Uh, yes, the directors, as you know, uh, JGC Consulting is your Sacramento representatives, and as is tradition, um, we have an annual legislative report to the full board, uh, usually around December. So Jonathan Clay and Aaron Gilbert are here. Uh, they'll have a relatively short report for you, but they're available to ask any, you know, answer any questions that you may have on your mind. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, at this late hour, we will be as efficient as possible for you guys. As you know, um, 2020 was a year like no other we've ever experienced in Sacramento. Um, as a result of COVID, the legislature ended up recessing on March 16th through early May and then took an extended summer recess as well as a result of members testing positive for COVID. Um, the end of session in August also ended up quite a bit different as well. The Senate Republicans were exposed to COVID as a result of Senator Brian Jones of San Diego testing positive. And so the Senate Republicans had to participate via Zoom at the end of session. And the assembly continued to believe that members needed to be present in the chambers in order to vote. Um, whereas the Senate believed remote voting was allowed. Um, just as an example of how different this year was, typically over a two year session, there'd be about 4,000 bills introduced. And in 2019, Governor Newsom signed just under 1,200 bills and vetoed about 170. And in 2020, the last two weeks of session, there was only about 500 bills that went through the process and Governor Newsom signed about 450 of those and vetoed just over 50. Um, when the Senate and Assembly weren't fighting with each other over rules, when to return to Sacramento, how they could do that safely, the number of bills that would be allowed to move, they were fighting with the governor over his executive powers and spending money entering into contracts over um, PPE. I'm sure you'll remember those big news articles and um, entering into those contracts without oversight of the legislative branch. So looking ahead, for as crazy as 2020 was, we anticipate much of the same for 2021. We don't anticipate staff coming back to the legislature. Um, we think the building will continue to be closed for the most part. And in fact, the assembly was sworn in on Monday at Golden One Arena to allow for social distancing and the Senate was sworn in and Senate chambers, but with no guests and limited staff. And we actually still continue to hear of COVID casing, cases occurring at the Capitol on actually a near daily, weekly basis. So it's still really blowing up in Sacramento. Um, members have not been given a bill introduction limit, but have been advised that only about a dozen bills or so will move this year. Of course, depending on COVID in the building, if they have to shut down and that kind of thing again. Um, bills will only have one policy hearing and then their fiscal hearing. And like 2020, um, the public testimony will be given via phone-in testimony and written testimony, which always makes the policy hearings last much longer, as I'm sure you guys can understand. <laughs> um, and we will share our first bill report tomorrow with staff. Um, and just as a side note, we don't have any of the committee chairs or the membership information yet. We anticipate that information. Um, I would think before January 1st. So hopefully in the next week or so, we'll have that information. Um, and I'll kick it over to Jonathan to give you guys some scoop on the election and some specific legislation that we anticipate. Well, as some of you may know, there was an election this year um, and it wasn't all at the federal level. Um, interesting to kind of see how things broke down uh, here in California. Um, on the assembly side, there's now 60 Democratic members, 19 Republicans and one independent. The Republicans actually gained a seat in the assembly, whereas in the Senate, we now have 30 Democrats, one vacancy because uh, Holly Mitchell from Los Angeles uh, won her election for County Board of Soups. So there'll be a special election to fill that and nine Republicans. Uh, the Republicans in the Senate actually lost two seats that I don't think they were necessarily anticipating. So effectively, um, the Democratic majority has over a supermajority in both houses now. Um, 
what's going to be interesting to see is we're going to be playing the biggest game of political musical chairs um, here in 2021 with you know folks jumping ship to go work in a Biden administration. We saw it already with the announcement that Governor Newsom's chief of staff will likely be leaving and going to work in the Biden administration. Uh, a new person, Jim Dubu, has been named as the governor's special advisor. We're guessing he'll be the chief of staff once the Anna O'Leary goes back to Washington. Um, then if uh, current Attorney General Becerra is appointed and uh, passes confirmation to be the Health and Human Services to secretary at the federal level, this could mean that Governor Newsom has three different appointments to make. One to fill uh, uh, soon to be Vice President Kamala Harris's uh, vacated US Senate seat, um, possibly the Attorney General spot. And then if you know the sort of word on the street that it is actually Secretary of State Padilla that will be appointed to that US Senate seat and the Secretary of State's position. So. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, special elections to fill vacancies. One thing that's interesting, there was uh, just a news article um, earlier this week where there was discussion how uh, House Speaker Pelosi has made it known that they don't want to see a lot of California congressional members appointed to positions within the Biden administration because I think everyone's a little nervous about trying to fill those congressional seats with uh, special elections, just because uh, nationwide and in California, the at the congressional level, Republicans picked up seats and uh, regained some uh, ground there. Um, and then finally, I mean, the, just the, also the recent news about Senator Feinstein and the speculation has been pretty rampant in Sacramento that that may be yet another uh, appointment for the governor. And of course, everyone likes the joke. And there's probably some truth in the joke that the governor might just appoint himself and get out of being in the, the eye of the storm on all this COVID. So we'll see. Um, you know, I think then the other thing that's going to color uh, a lot of stuff for this next year, it's not really on everyone's radar, but there is actually a recall going on currently um, of Governor Newsom. And a judge recently gave them more time to collect signatures. I think they're somewhere in the 800,000 range. And I think they're shooting for about, they need 1.2, 1.6 million signatures to ensure qualifying. So, you know, that will always change the dynamic in Sacramento. So we're moving on to legislation. Um, something that we've talked about in the LICA committee over the last two years has been SB 45, which was a resources bond. That bill has been reintroduced again verbatim as SB 45. So the um, new bond, I've always been a little hesitant given the, um, you know, with COVID, just the state of the economy that a bond could pass. But, you know, I was surprised when the stem cell bond passed with the voters this fall. So you know, that'll be something we should definitely watch and make sure that uh, the, the district's interests are represented in the various pots that are available there. Aqua will also, given the conversation earlier about uh, water rates, Aqua is looking to carry legislation um, related to the uh, validation lawsuits and uh, streamlining that process a little bit. So as that develops, I will keep the district uh, apprised of that as well. I think one of the kind of switching gears over to the budget really quick, and then I'll start to kind of wrap this up. Um, everyone, I think, was caught a little off guard by having a budget surplus kind of show up out of nowhere. Um, and what's going to be interesting is already the governor's, the legislative analyst office has said that they believe the budget surplus to be about $26 billion um, this year. The governor at a, a speech that he gave, I believe earlier this week, has hinted that he thinks the, the budget surplus is $15 billion. Um, I think that will set up a definite fight between the legislature and the governor over how to expend money, how to backfill cuts that were made already in this year's budget. Um, and I think it's gonna set up a bit of, if the legislature can stay in session with COVID, uh, tension between the legislative branch and the executive branch over who's running the state, how it's being run. Um, 
I think there's going to be some oversight on what was last year, AB 3030, which was the, the plan to conserve 30% of land and ocean resources by uh, 2030. Governor, the bill failed in the legislature, so the governor did it via executive order. And I think because of the controversy around that bill that the legislature is going to want to have some oversight over that governor's executive order. Same goes for the governor's executive order he did this fall on phasing out gasoline and reducing emissions. I think that will also be something the legislature is going to want to have their imprint on. So I think we're going to see a little bit more of butting of heads between uh, the legislative and the executive branch. So definitely, I think, something to kind of look out for. And going back to the budget, uh, I think we can expect to see uh, the governor release his January budget proposal. My guess is like January 7th or 8th, which is like Thursday, Friday of that first week. Um, his constitutional requirements, the 10th, and that's a Sunday. So it'll be sometime just before that. Um, you know, I think I'll, the, oh, the other thing in terms of the governor does have a few controversies kind of rolling. I mean, the, the, the elected officials, whether it's the governor or the mayor of San Francisco, or even a county supervisor down in LA, who've all been out eating at restaurants while everything's being shut down. But the other thing that I think is going to be really problematic for the governor, um, is just tweeted out tonight that, um, with EDD and unemployment insurance, they're backlogged to the tune of almost 750,000 cases. So at least a solid four weeks worth of cases. And I think the legislature's made it clear that they're going to want to engage and try and correct that problem. So with that, I will take a break for questions. But actually, first, just want to say also thank you to the district for your confidence in us and extending our contract. We really enjoy working with you and greatly appreciate your uh, confidence in having us represent you in Sacramento. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Any questions or comments from the board? Just a quick comment on your last with the EED. Um, is the is the E the EDD, is that person who's in charge still in still in place? I mean, that is, I understand why or how they got there. I don't it's, know. It's phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> Aaron, you might know the answer. I, the per, I don't know if, so the governor's already put one new person in there to kind of help right the ship, and I don't think the ship's been righted. I believe that the person is planning on retiring soon. That's they, right. That's they, right. They need to retire quick. I mean, I um I'm totally unsatisfactory in that. I mean, I they have problems in the campaign offices. It was uh, a real interesting event this year to run for office and try to get through to those folks. And the only thing that looked at that made it any benefit was, hey, they're leaving me alone and they got other business to do with the state right now than to worry about whether I get an FPPC number. Um, uh, just phenomenal on the unemployment. I, I still can't believe we're as bad as we are. Thank you, Director Gunther. Any other questions or comments from the directors? Yes, I have a, a quick question. Um, so Aaron, you, you touched on um, on the limit of the number of bills that assembly members can propose this year. Uh, first question, I interpreted that rule as, uh, as a mandate, but I think you, you said it was not, uh, not really uh, being enforced. Did I, did I maybe misunderstand your comments there? No, there is a hard and fast number. Um, I believe it's typically around 20 bills. Um, they're just being encouraged to narrow their bill packages to a smaller amount just because they're not sure if they're gonna be able to remain in session for the full time and bills are not going to be double referred to multiple policy committees. So in order to just really move the bills through the process, they, they're gonna to have to limit that number. So my, my concern then with that is that maybe the bill packages that are proposed will be much more broad in scope. There'll be a lot more writers uh, along with them. Is that is that a concern that you guys share as well? What should we kind of expect from, from this rule change? 
I think you'll see a lot of committee bills be introduced where um, like an omnibus type bill, or you'll see um, historically, there'll be four or five bills introduced that all deal with the same topic or on the same subject. And the authors are kind of jockeying for whose bill it is. And so I think you'll see that be consolidated as well, where people kind of get behind a bill and an issue and then jointly co-author it or, um, and try to move that issue forward rather than maybe claiming, staking their claim on it as individual. So it sounds like maybe you have a more positive spin on, <laughs> on what could come from this. I would think so. I mean, Jonathan, do you want to weigh in on what your thoughts might be? Yeah, and I'll just I'll look at this last year as an example where the assembly really didn't do much to limit their bill number, whereas the Senate sort of not by mandate, but most senators really reduced their bill package. And there were some very hard feelings between the two houses. And I've been talking to Senate committee staff this fall, nor the, the discord between the Senate and the assembly at the end of session was high. Usually that kind of always, it's sort of a natural kind of ebb and flow. It'll occur. And then just before the very end, it gets better. Everything starts to move, bills move through. This year it didn't. The pro tem lost all three of her main bills just sitting on the assembly floor without a debate. Um, and that kind of sort of easing of the tensions didn't go away. And I've had a couple Senate committee staff specifically make sort of offhanded comments about, well, the assembly, if they're gonna send that many bills to us again, we're gonna have problems. So it, I think there's just this very interesting dynamic. The Senate and Assembly are in two different places on how to conduct business. Senate's allowing remote, Assembly is not. We will see how they approach the bill loads. Um, the Senate's always sensitive to how many bills uh, the Assembly sends them just because there's twice as many members. So even if both houses have 12 bills per member, since there's 80 members in the Assembly, there's just double the amount of bills that the Senate will have to consider in that second house review. Um, but I think Aaron really highlighted something that for insiders, we're all gonna watch, which is the committee bills. Those committee bills don't necessarily fall under a bill limit. And I think you'll see folks trying to put a lot more stuff that may not be as non-controversial as years past, because that's kind of the standard for committee bills. So that's, I think, gonna be an area to watch. Great. No, I appreciate the feedback on that. Very interesting. Uh, John Weed, if I could. Um, question I have is, oh, first of all, a point. There's a strong interest on the part of at least two board members of a proposed legislation, which may not have been drafted yet, to allow the billing of the service charge on the property tax bills. So just giving, making that a note that if it comes up uh, it's a particular interest to at least some members of our board. Next, when you say the state has a surplus, but there's going to be such an extraordinary shortfall at the local and level, county, cities, and special districts, might that put an extraordinary draw on the state of California? That's a really interesting question because, you know, representing local government, we're, we're anticipating with the, especially for cities who depend a lot on the sales tax revenue, that's gonna be a huge hit for them. Um, but again, this is a great example of the dysfunction within the state budget where so much of the general fund revenues that come in are really dependent on that very top part of the taxpayer class within California. And so it's gonna be interesting to see how the state decides to try and help um, local government. I mean, counties have been taking a huge hit in terms of increased numbers coming on to um, county help for food, medical care, and all that. Um, and I will say the state doesn't always necessarily listen or try and assist the local government. So I, I think it's going to be a, t a tension. Um, I think also I'm kind of, if I had to guess, um, there's been already some bills introduced that talks about wanting to force school districts to 
have in-person learning starting as early as March. And so I think maybe the state may dedicate some funds to helping make sure that happens. Um, and then when you look at the revenue projections, so there's a surplus this year and then it falls off a cliff. So LAO, I believe shows budget year plus one going into a deficit. Aaron, I'm gonna misspeak here. Was it what, 20 million or 20 billion or 30 billion? Yeah, I believe over the three year it was anticipated to be about 54 billion. Yeah. So, um, so I don't, I, I'm not directly answering the question, but I think there's going to be interesting tension there between the state and locals. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, don't forget that uh, every uh, public transportation system in California uh, is suffering. Uh, immensely. Revenues are down like 90% at BART, at AC Transit, at all the Southern California um, transportation networks. Um, and they have, you know, just like our water district, very high fixed costs and, um, you know, can't get, can't get out of them. And by the way, BART just, uh, the BART board approved a new uh, labor contract, which, uh, in light of everything that's going on right now was uh, a, a, a very generous contract. Let's just say that. Well, and let's take a look at the big picture. So the governor did an executive order basically calling for elimination of fossil fuels by what, 2035, 2030. I mean, train, mass transit, whether it's trains, buses, all that are gonna be the cornerstone for helping move people. And if our, entire mass transit system collapses due to the lack of ridership during COVID, I mean, then what? So yeah, um, it's, it's tough. And I mean, there's definitely industry sectors that are really hurting on the tourism side, hotels, of course, restaurants, anything in the service industry. So um, yeah, it's just a very, uh, it's just a very stark difference between what's thriving right now versus what is not. I think there's gonna be a lot of different entities trying to um, have their hand out to the state government. Including the state going with their hand out to the feds. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Clay, and thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Any last minute question for them? If not, I would like to move us along since we still have quite a bit more to go. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you to both of you for being so patient. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Have a great evening and great holiday. You do all as well. All right, with that, I believe the next item is general manager's report 6.4.1 is update on COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, and uh, Gina, would you please share the screen? Thank you. I mean. I'll just walk through the presentation. This will be very quick, but there are a few things that I wanted to make the board aware of. Um, so I'll cover what's been going on over the last month, what our current operational status are, and any next steps. Next slide, please. So our district objectives remain the same, the three-legged stool of keeping employees safe, making sure that we continue providing uh, the essential services that the community is relying us for on, and then supporting our employees and their families during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, since November, uh, the statewide conditions have definitely worsened. And this is a nice graphical representation of what the state looked like then. And now the state is mostly in the purple region, which uh, indicates widespread COVID. Next slide. I thought this slide was uh, very interesting. I thought you might find it useful. And that is uh, you have a definite um, surge uh, as the graph that you can see the second one from the left shows uh, way, way more cases than we were experiencing in the previous peak over the summer. And then the other thing I wanted to point out is there's a graphical representation of the demographics of the state and what the, uh, the numbers uh, are in terms of state 
percentage versus what the number of cases are for each of those demographics. So you can see that uh, the number of people in the 18 to 49 range um, is actually, um, uh, you know, the, the number of uh, cases is lower than what would be expected in that range, but higher. Uh, I'm sorry, the number of cases is higher than what would be expected in that range based on population. Um, and then I, I have heard news reports of the Latino segment of our state being severely impacted. And this uh, graph, graphical representation on the right does show that. So um, you can see that the, the purple bar extends much further than the gray dash, which indicates that uh, that particular group is suffering a higher number of cases than their population should suggest. And you can see other groups as well. Next slide, please, Gina. So uh, I'm sure you're aware California issued a regional stay at home order and uh, that's been in effect. Uh, several of the Bay Area counties uh, were proactive and issued their shelter in place orders um, before the state did. Um, one of the triggers is supposed to be when your ICU bed availability gets as low as 15%, but the county health officers that decided to implement the shelter in place order were forecasting that we were on our way there. But currently ICU availability is much higher than, well, a little higher than 15%. Uh, here at the district itself, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've had four positive COVID cases. Um, these are the first confirmed cases uh, since the two cases that we had around July. Um, subsequently, uh, we have two employees that have been trained by Johns Hopkins University uh, to do uh, contact tracing. We've done that. Uh, there are some employees in uh, quarantine and or being tested as appropriate and we have you know, notified those employees and that's why they are doing that. Um, so far indications are that we do not have a widespread outbreak, uh, but you know, the district is not immune of what's going on in, in the community as a whole. Next slide. Um, I thought the board might be interested in a new smartphone tool <clears throat> that is designed uh, to slow the spread of COVID-19. Uh, all the directors have been issued Apple phones. Should you wish to do so, uh, you can opt in to receive COVID-19 exposure alerts. The way you do that is you go into the settings on your phone and it's just a, an activate uh, a toggle button that you will see there. Uh, you agree to a couple of conditions. And then what happens is if you get within six feet of somebody who also has that activated and has been tested positive and has indicated on his or her phone that they have done that, it could be an indication that maybe it would be good to get tested um, or perhaps quarantine. If you have an Android phone, uh, there's an app that you can download to do that. But if you weren't aware, I thought that you, you might be interested in that. Um, we are going to make district employees aware of this functionality too. It's supposed to be private and anonymous um, and, and protective of data, uh, you know, but uh, we, we haven't dug deep into the uh, application yet to determine exactly what's going on there, but it does look like it's potentially useful. Uh, in terms of vaccinations, uh, we are keeping in contact with the county health officer regarding when they might be available. Uh, good news, the FDA panel reviewing the Pfizer vaccine um, apparently recommended approval for that. So this slide is a little off and it is anticipated that the second vaccine from Moderna will be uh, reviewed and hopefully approved shortly thereafter. Uh, the issue with these vaccines is they both require two doses and there's some storage and logistics issues with temperatures, especially for the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, it's our understanding that California is slated to get 327,000 initial doses of the Pfizer vaccine, which could uh, be delivered as early as uh, the middle of this month. 
Um, our understanding also is that there will be prioritization for high risk healthcare workers. So we're not expecting the, these vaccines to be widely available for district staff um, anytime extremely soon, but this is all good news. Next slide. Um, the other piece of good news is we're in the winter and water demand is low. So if we do have a major outbreak uh, with certain groups that are specialized, like say uh, utility workers or water treatment plant operators and so forth. The fact that there's lower water demand at this time of the year should make that more manageable. Um, we are also uh, planning for the future. Um, and part of that is, you know, we have a draft plan to ultimately bring back employees, but we're going to be conservative. And then we're also working on a plan on how to address any delinquent accounts. And we'll be working with the board on that. Next slide. So um, in terms of- Can I ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Slide. Um, just out of curiosity, I'm, uh, if there were a widespread outbreak in a particular uh, group within our organization, would we then request mutual aid uh, or something like that to be able to, to cover uh, the positions that we would need to uh, to fill for that time being, and have any other districts been in a situation like that where they've they've requested some kind of mutual aid? As far as I know, I'm not aware of any districts that have requested mutual aid. Um, we are obviously uh, reviewing all of our, you know, safety uh, protocols and and taking another look at them now that the risk seems a little higher. Um, in terms of how we would operate, uh, one of the good things about having low water demand is we can shut down a facility now without um, major issues associated with it, like a water treatment plant number two. And uh, we're also working on not only um, do we have already mutual aid agreements in, in effect, um, we are working on um, you know, contracting with uh, contractors that could help us if we ever found ourselves, say, short staff um, with certain employee classifications. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to bring something to the board regarding that issue uh, relatively soon. So that, that, that's kind of our strategy, as well as we've looked into um, getting temporary employees. The problem is one of the problems is, is the, um, the current COVID surge is national. So it's not like there's quiet areas in the country and then areas of the country that are doing fine. Um, so uh, the mutual aid aspect of it m might become challenging unless uh, certain areas of the country begin getting it under control. Uh, but this is something that, you know, we're worrying about and we have conversations about. And I, I feel pretty good where we are now, but, you know, that can change pretty quickly. Thank so you. that's the update. Um, the other thing, just so that you know, is should vaccines become available to ACWD, but not necessarily enough for all of our employees, uh, we're also coming up with a plan on who would receive those vaccinations first. Uh, for example, employees that are able to work from home probably wouldn't be the first employees to receive the vaccination. We would prioritize employees that we need to have come to work. Uh, and that would be both to protect them and the safety of their coworkers. So um, maybe that won't come into play, but we are trying to plan for you know, any sort of possibility. So I hope to be back at the January board meeting with an update, but that's where we stand right now. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Um, any other questions or comments <coughs> for Mr. Shaver regarding 6.4.1 on COVID update? And if the board members find this helpful, that's great, these monthly updates. But if you have any suggestions and would like to convey them to me offline about um, you know, how, how I could provide more useful information for you, don't, don't be shy. Just let me know. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Um, I'm not hearing any questions. So I think that's move on to 6.4.2, please. So 6.4.2 is on the agenda for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, staff 
uh, also um, is monitoring what's going on at SFPUC. They had a special meeting on November 30th, as well as I know that Director Sethi attended that meeting and was planning on making some comments too. So Ms. Hydas, our water resources and conservation, uh, a water resources manager rather, will make a, a brief, uh, uh, provide a brief um, review of this SFPUC meeting and what's going on so the board is aware. And then uh, we can take questions and or director comments right after that. Ms. Hydas. Great, thank you, Mr. Shaver. The San Francisco Public Utilities Commission has initiated a series of special meeting workshops to provide a forum to discuss the San Francisco Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan and related issues with participation from environmental organizations. The first workshop was held on Monday, November 30th with two topics on the agenda. First, Steve Ritchie, San Francisco PUC's Assistant General Manager of the Water Enterprise, gave an overview of the SFPUC's Tuolumne River water rights and its legal obligations under the Raker Act, the agreements with Modesto Irrigation District and Turlock Irrigation District, and the water supply agreement with the wholesale customers. The second, more lengthy item, uh, covered the legal framework and scientific basis for the water quality control plan for the San Francisco Bay, Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta Estuary, or more commonly known as the Bay Delta Plan. First, a panel of representatives from the environmental community presented data and viewpoints in support of the State Water Resources Control Board's adopted unimpaired flows approach to meeting the Bay Delta Plan objectives. As our board is aware, there is also a process underway to negotiate an alternative approach among stakeholders to meeting Bay Delta plan objectives through the voluntary agreements. A panel of SFPUC representatives also participated in the meeting and Michael Carlin, acting general manager, briefly noted their work on the voluntary agreement process in coordination with California Department of Fish and Wildlife and that other habitat and flow issues must be considered in managing the Tuolumne River. PUC staff neither made a detailed pre technical presentation nor responded to the presentation made by the NRDC and others, other than Mr. Carlin making brief comments that were that there was a lot of information presented that staff would like to unpack and that SS SFPUC was not necessarily in agreement with all of the assertions that were made uh, during the other presentations. A future technical presentation from staff was requested by the commissioners during the discussion period. During the public comment period, Bosca made comments as well in support of the Tuolumne River Voluntary Agreement, identifying SFPUC's legal and contra contractual obligations to provide a reliable supply of high quality water at a fair price to its member agencies, including us, and noting the severe impacts to Bosca customers if, adopt if the adopted Bay Delta Plan's unimpaired flows approach is actually implemented. While this first workshop focused on the Tuolumne River and the Delta, the, commis the commissioners noted at the start of the meeting that at least one additional workshop in the series is planned and will focus on water supply and demand issues. Given the commissioner's request for a technical presentation from SFPUC staff as well, I would anticipate that additional workshops may also be scheduled. Staff will continue to monitor this process and keep the board apprised of any significant developments. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Haidas. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, the director, Seth, do you have a uh, point to make a comment on this report? Uh, well, I'm reporting under 7.1 on the same subject. May I move into my comments? Um, Council, I think this is perfectly fine, correct? <laughs> Yes, it's fine. Yes. They're both on the agenda. It's fine for director. If, if there are there other director questions for Ms. Hydas? I'm not hearing any. So, Director Sethi, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hydas stated the, uh, the facts of the meeting very well. Um, it was a three hour meeting from two to five last Monday. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to offer a little bit of an opinion here uh, for the benefit of other board members. 
what I'm witnessing, whether it's uh, hearing things at the at the state level or local level, is we've got this real division here going on between uh, San Francisco and the um, Tuolumne River voluntary agreements approach, and then what the State Water Resources Control Board put out on the Bay Delta plan. And basically it boils down to this, and Laura, you can correct me if I'm misstating something, but San Francisco and Bosca are supporting unimpaired flows that are no more than 20% and that are uh, in certain spring months where it's, it, it's pulse flows that are going down the river. <clears throat> the State Water Resources Control Board, based on a lot of scientific evidence from the same presenters that were presenting at this meeting, ruled after uh, lengthy consideration that uh, the unimpaired, unimpaired flow should be at 40% between December and May, um, twice the level of what San Francisco and Bosca is offering, and that it needs to be in a range of, uh, the average should be 40 within a range of 30 to 50% unimpaired flows of uh, water being released from Hetch Hetchy down, down the Tuolumne River out to the bay, out to the Delta and Bay. So you have quite a disparity there. And uh, as was noted, there's not a single environmental organization and no scientific organization that is backing San Francisco and the uh, Tuolumne River voluntary agreements. So we go to the aqua meetings and uh, other industry meetings where we hear this heavy emphasis from the governor and uh, Wade Crowfoot and, and others about uh, uh, all the effort that's being put in behind, behind the voluntary agreements. But then you have the entire environmental community and scientific community that are in opposition to what San Francisco is proposing and, and, and are opposed to the, the uh, they're not opposed to the voluntary agreements, they're, they're against uh, what the result might be. So <clears throat> it was noted uh, um, uh, that um, we have this really, this disparity um, going on within the water industry right now. And Bosca was very upset that San Francisco did not have a rebuttal in place for the presentations that were made. And they were expecting that they were gonna hear a rebuttal to the scientific community. I found the presentations from the scientific community, the same presentations that were given to the state water board to be very convincing without hearing the other side uh, offer a rebuttal that uh, you really do need to have um, more than 20% unimpaired flows, that at 30% you get fair results with the fish and the salmon, at 40% it's, it's much better and at 50% of course it, it would be, everything would be hunky-dory. So, um, I'm looking forward to the, the next uh, round of uh, meetings. And by the way, um, I attended the Bosca Board Policy Committee meeting yesterday where um, the CEO, Nicole Sankula, gave uh, a 10 point rebuttal to uh, what was presented by the scientific community up in San Francisco. Peter Dreckmeyer, who was one of the presenters from Tuolumne River Trust, uh, was one of the presenters at San Francisco. Uh, he um, accused uh, the CEO of Bosca and other Bosca members as not representing the facts properly. So it was a very tense meeting yesterday in the board, in the board policy committee meeting. And uh, my understanding, and maybe 
Ms. Sidis or, or Mr. Shaver can comment on this. I am only reading between the lines of what's going on in private, private session, but it appears that Bosca is suing the state board. Is that true? Over the Bay Delta plan? I believe both SFPUC and Bosca uh, have initiated litigation. Is that correct, Laura? Uh, it may be. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Yeah, we, yeah, we can sure. get back to the full board and confirm, or maybe Mr. Miyaki knows. Yeah. They, are in they are in litigation. They're also, Bosca's also in litigation on the FERC <clears throat> okay. uh, process. Or our Bosca board member representative also <laughs> might do something, too. Sorry about that, <laughs> Director Weed. But the, yeah, uh, <clears throat> quick brief on, uh, is Rex Seppi finished his comments? Yes, I think I'm finished on that there here. Okay, good. Um, it is interesting to note a change in personalities in San Francisco PUC and the city of San Francisco. The Kellys are both out of the loop right now and um, Naomi Kelly being the city administrator married to Harlan Kelly, who was the general manager of SFPUC, who's under indictment. Um, the, new, the two new board members on the uh, PUC are Maxwell, who was a member of the Board of Supervisors, who voted for unimpaired flows as a supervisor, a unanimous vote, was vetoed by the uh, mayor. And Ed Her uh, Harrington, was a former general manager, but after leaving SFPUC became head of Greenpeace and is one of the, was head of one of the major environmental groups in the, um, in the country. So those changes um, have been noted by the, part, by the Bosca staff and there may now be daylight between the position of San Francisco and that of Bosca is the concern. Yeah, I would say that uh, um, Nicole Sankula was uh, um, very defensive yesterday, uh, as were other Bosca members, but there were quite a few speakers yesterday on behalf of the environmental communities and, and other residents from around the Bay Area that support the State Water Board recommendations for 40% unimpaired flows. Yeah, and, and the only thing that I'd like to add, if I may, unless Director Weed, you had additional comments. Uh, only one other comment that I also made at the Bosco meeting. We had a presentation at Aqua a number of, several years ago where a representative of the Department of Water Resources made the comment that one, they only had the staff to deal with unimpaired flows, not with the voluntary agreements. And second, that they only had the legal authority to deal with flows and not voluntary agreements. Whether the second one, uh, the council um, questioned, but did admit that staffing was something that uh, had not been identified as how they were going to staff the unimpaired flows. Thank you, Director Wee. Thank you, Director Sethi. Mr. Shaver? <clears throat> Just one thing I'd like to point out uh, based on my observations of the November 30th special SFPUC meeting. The scientists that were presenting, um, yeah, they, they were persuasive, but they were scientists that are representing NRDC and the Tuolumne River Trust. So um, I think I think it was disappointing that San Francisco staff was not in a position to also uh, explain uh, what, what they're doing. Uh, but the voluntary agreement negotiations have been going on you know, relatively privately too. So what the environmental community is doing here is making those their position in the negotiations public. Um, so I think uh, the outcome of this is SFPUC staff, at least, is on defense. And it will be, um, now it's going to be challenging for them to, uh, I think, make up for some ground that I think they've lost. And uh, based on uh, SFPUC's modeling, the 40% um, uh, unimpaired flows proposal uh, does impact uh, ACWD San Francisco supplies significantly. And uh, however, we have not 
uh, closely reviewed uh, their science other than to hear what San Francisco staff is saying. So uh, more to come on this issue. It's an important issue for the region and it's a, an important issue um, for ACWD. I am not surprised that the two sides are far apart. Uh, ACWD has had its own experience dealing with um, you know, environmental permitting and balancing water supply issues with that locally here. And it's a negotiation process, but both sides have to give a little bit. And I don't know if the voluntary agreements, if, if they're still you know, moving in the right direction. I hope so. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll like to move us along to item seven since we still got quite a bit more to go. 7.2, um, a very short report. There was a meeting of the County of Alameda Countywide Oversight Board on the third of this month. And uh, I attended and as the representative of all of the special districts in Alameda County, the elected representative and uh, Director Weed is the alternate elected and he attended. So we had two items to uh, take care of. Uh, one was rather routine, it was just to uh, make certain amendments to our conflict of interest um, bylaws and, and code. Um, so we, we got that taken care of. And then we had a, a much more complicated issue that we had to deal with, which was um, dealing with the commercial development loan for the Swans Marketplace project, which is in downtown Oakland. And um, I'll just read a, a a little summary here of what this was dealing with. The staff was recommending that uh, this is the uh, county um, auditor's office um, was recommending that the Oakland Redevelopment Successor Agency adopt a resolution approving the resubordination and modification of a $1.15 million secured commercial development loan made by the former Oakland Redevelopment Agency in 1997 and was previously resubordinated in 2013 to allow essentially the Swans Marketplace project to, to pursue some uh, additional financing options. So now they wanna go through a resubordination and re uh, another refinance and they're actually taking this out all the way to, I think it was 2050, <laughs> with uh, an incentive to pay off in 2030. So they started this process in, in 1997. And as I mentioned to Director Weed, this group, the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation, that is uh, managing the Swans Marketplace project, got one really nice sweet deal. I mean, to have essentially, they're getting the benefit of all the rents and, and everything off the properties. And uh, they've got 50 years of low interest financing. So we took care of that and we will have our normal annual meeting next month. That's it. Thank you, Director Sethi. Then let's move on to item 7.3, report from Directors Akbari, Gunther, Sethi, and Weed on the Aqua December virtual meeting. Um, I'll keep my comments very brief. I attended the uh, Aqua conference last week. Um, much It was much shorter than uh, these conferences, conferences generally are, but uh, they were able to pack a lot of great information into that. Um, the one session that I did want to just highlight a little bit was the diversity, equity, and inclusion session that they had on Wednesday, December 2nd. Um, obviously here at ACWD, we're looking at implementing uh, a, a program um, within, uh, within that space as well. Um, one of the one of the interesting things that I learned was that East Bay Mud has just recently gone through a similar uh, a similar program, and so I think uh, there might be a good opportunity for us to uh, sit down and talk to them. Uh, Frank Mellon from uh, from EB Mud made a presentation 
Um, and, you know, they're facing some of the similar challenges that we are here at the district, um, being also from uh, the East Bay region here. So, um, so I just wanted to highlight that. I think uh, if uh, Bob or, or Jen want to reach out to them, I think that it might be a good idea and a good learning experience for us. Well, just so that you know, I'll be meeting with um, their general manager a week from Friday as part of a COA meeting, and that topic is on the agenda. Wonderful. Well, you're already ahead of me, so thank you, Bob. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Director Akbari. Director okay. Center Wee Dosethi, who wants to go next? As John Weed, I attended also that week the uh, JPIA meeting, which uh, was held virtually. Um, JPIA is doing well financially and um, is uh, had rel remarkably good fortune with the COVID-19. 18,000 um, members that they support on their medical programs, they're relatively few, um, had encountered COVID-19, but those on medical issues where they ran into financial challenges or people that were in long-term medical care, some as long as 62 days. So relatively few cases ran up extraordinary cost. It's the same problem you have with the long-term medical health care programs. Uh, they also had good success in challenging the presumption for workers' compensation uh, claims uh, based on COVID-19. Uh, prevailing, I think, in 12 to 13 challenges. At the meeting itself, with um, the difficulty of having a aqua conference where you're on virtual, unfortunately, many of the sessions were taped weeks before. So, uh, for an example, on the COVID 19 session, which I also sat in on the aqua, the material was somewhat stale as people made individual com uh, comments. And um, you then could asked some questions, but it was uh, the prepared statements and videos were not as informative. Overall, um, I fear that we're going to be going to more and more of these in the future. I also was able to attend a number of aqua conferences during the course, course of the month that were uh, both the regional um, vision conferences, as well as a um, aqua vendor uh, sessions that they put on um, views that are not listed here specifically, but were attended on the free and therefore not necessary to report um, under this session. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wee. Director Sethi, Gunther. Um, I'll go ahead. Uh, I really missed the interaction, uh, to be honest. Uh, the conference doing a visual, virtual is easier, I think, for me, certainly with conflicts and, you know, work and everything, but the interaction's just not there. Um, I did attend the one session uh, regarding as the Supreme Court issues, and uh, it was, it's fun to listen to somebody else have problems. Uh, and particularly, it was, they were talking about between Texas and New Mexico. And so, you know, we talk about our, what we just talked about with the Tuolumne, there's some really serious problems going on between Texas and New Mexico. It doesn't even include the Colorado River. Uh, these are real grand issues. So um, it's, we're not alone. Uh, it's nice to know we're not alone. Um, I was a little disappointed with the PFA uh, regulating session. I, I just don't, I don't know. I think there's so much unknown with PFAs and they're chasing stuff. They don't even know what they're chasing yet. And it's a little fearful um, that we're chasing something we don't know why we're chasing uh, because we think it's bad, but they're chasing. And so interesting, it's interesting session. I'm glad I attended. The one on uh, water rates was very interesting. Um, effectively, <laughs> I, know, I know Director Weed doesn't like tiered rates, um, however, they basically said that San Juan Capistrano said tiered rates are perfectly legal. It's just that San Juan Capistrano didn't do them right. But it also, some, a lot of it was based on water budgets. And um, the one district that did water budgets, uh, Western um, Municipal uh, presented their, their water budget rate 
structures and Sanji was in on that. It was a good session. Um, I, I believe in tiered rates anyway, being legal. And, uh, but they seem to indicate that uh, it could be. And, uh, but there was also some discussion of property tax for water rates. And so I'm a little bit happy. Uh, then um, there was one guy and I can't remember what session he was in. He was a climate scientist and he was really interesting to listen to. That session I found um, in dealing with floods, increasing periods, uh, and, and it's not just water supply. It really comes down a lot to floods and repeats of, there's stuff being talked about of major floods from like the flood of 1862. And they're not even looking at that. And that flood, it, it's, it's like earthquake for, that we're, we're all focused in on earthquakes and we're not focusing on the possibility of some of these flood issues. Um, let's see, COVID impacts, listen to that one. Hey, Jim, I have a question uh, for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, would you approve a 2%, 2% rate increase if we went to tiered rates? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think we could do that. But <laughs> yeah, since we're no longer on that subject or that agenda item. Nice try. Um, Good thought. Um, yeah, the guy, the guy is David, Daniel Swain, Climate Scientist Institute, uh, and, and I expected, I didn't expect such a good presentation by him. And uh, that one there, if, if you have the opportunity to just see it was, I think it was very interesting and um, enlightening in, in concepts of fires and, and spring dry periods, the, the dry periods being longer, et cetera. We're really running late tonight, so um, I'll call it at that. Um, I did also attend Region 5. Do we want to discuss anything on Region 5 yet? Um, Paul and I both were on Region 5, uh, that one. Yeah, um, go, go ahead, Jim, because I'm going to okay. bring up Region 5, too. Um, one thing, Paul, Paul did uh, carry the flag for, for Director Weed and uh, regarding the tax, the tax uh, base. And Aqua is involved in that. They are reviewing it. And Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, they're sending it to legal now. They're gonna send it to the legal committee, I believe, for the well, uh, property tax. Let, let me give us a, a summary here, if I may, and then perhaps you can add on, Jim. Okay, because that's the big, that was the big gist I got out of the region of five, to be honest. So we had 50 people in our region five meeting yesterday. And um, uh, we went through all the different committees that were there uh, in Aqua, uh, uh, doing a little three, three to five minute review. And uh, so uh, Parrot Harmon, the general manager of Scotts Valley Water District and myself presented on the issue of putting the uh, uh, service charge on the property tax bill. And she's exploring it with her board right now down in Scotts Valley. Um, so a year ago to back up, I put together a written proposal for the local government committee uh, uh, for the, at the aqua session last December. And they considered that proposal. Um, and then in the spring, when we had our meeting, I gave a, a, a fuller in-person presentation and uh, we then decided to refer to the, the legislative committee for review to see if there was any amending or enabling legislation that they thought was needed in order to promote this uh, concept. They came back to our committee, committee in the fall and said, no, we don't see any reason to, uh, that there's nothing in, in Prop 218 or Prop 26 that violates 
what we're what we're proposing. And so we made uh, two decisions in the fall. Uh, one was to refer this to the legal uh, Aqua Legal Affairs Committee for review. And the second was to set up a, a forum at the spring Aqua session next year with a full panel discussion of, and we have, I already have everybody identified. So I'm actually helping to put this together. Uh, uh, an attorney from Best Best and Krieger, who's an expert on Prop 218 and Prop 26, um, and um, uh, is a proponent of doing this. Um, a couple of financial consultants like Sanjay Gore, who advise water districts. Uh, and then uh, the water districts that uh, have implemented this, either board member or general managers that could talk uh, about this issue. And we'll, we're gonna put together a forum. And so uh, that's moving forward. And uh, I, would, I would say it's actually building up some momentum and steam right now because Dave Egerton has heard this a number of times. Uh, Cindy Tuck has heard it. Um, uh, our president and vice president of Aqua have become more familiar with this. Pam Tobin was uh, on with me on the uh, local government committee. So um, I was very encouraged yesterday and, and um, Ernie Avala, who was just reelected to the Contra Costa Water Board, told the entire group that the presentation that uh, Paul Sethi gave earlier this year was the best presentation he had heard in four years of attending Aqua meetings. And uh, that was a really nice compliment to, to have him say that to the entire group. So I've been doing my networking and, uh, and I really feel like we're gaining some momentum here. Patrick, this is gonna, go to your committee now <laughs> and uh, hopefully we can kick it around there and, and uh, have a nice spring uh, uh, conference session uh, to you know, further discuss this. But there are a lot of people that are coming on board now. A lot of people that are saying it's a, it, you've got an, in, this is what they've told me directly, you've got an intellectually honest argument for why districts should do this. So I give credit to John Weed, um, you know, <laughs> as the forerunner here, I've been trying to carry the baton forward. And uh, I, I really do think we're making a lot of progress here. So it's not gonna go away. And I closed by saying yesterday that I think, and this is where I got a lot of concurrence, this could have more impact on low income communities uh, and, and the uh, under, underserved communities than probably any other issue that Aqua could push forward in the next couple of years. And a lot of people agree. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Director Sethi, for your report back. Just I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna report on 7.3. 7 okay. So I did not attend, I wasn't able to attend the Monday, uh, Wednesday morning sessions, but I, I did <clears throat> uh, uh, start attending with the uh, afternoon uh, keynote speak, uh, speaker, Tim Quinn. I thought he gave a fabulous presentation in half an hour about all the work that he's doing at Stanford and everything. And I really like how he's engaging people that are retired or former board members from across the water industry to work with him. I found the uh, innovation session on water management and renewable energy to be quite informative. I'm gonna bring my comments to a subsequent meeting when we are back talking about our, um, our own energy initiatives. And the, uh, the biomass power session was quite interesting about what's going on up in the, uh, uh, across our landscape of California where uh, Bain and company, uh, the consulting firm did a 
really detailed analysis of what are all the revenue opportunities that can be created from biomass and how it needs to be done at very localized levels uh, across the state. So you sprinkle biomass places uh, all through the forested areas and how many jobs can be created and they analyze all the different products that can be made and marketed uh, and, and what's profitable. And I find that we're gonna probably see a lot of uh, future financing of that going on. Um, I attended a couple of other sessions on, on Thursday in the morning and because I had the oversight meeting also in the morning, so I only attended one session and that was reactivating the floodplains in Sacramento Valley. And uh, that's quite interesting because they're not only trying to benefit the, uh, the farmers like the rice growers in that area, but also help trying to help the, the wildlife and um, uh, the floodplains of the area for, for nature. So uh, yeah, it, it's different. I, I agree with, with Director Gunther, you don't get the interaction that you wanna have and, and shake people's hands and everything. But some of these sessions are, are really informative and uh, Director Weed and Director Gunther and I went through the, uh, the regional presentations in late October and November uh, that I thought were really quite extraordinary, really informative presentations. Yeah, I, I agree, Paul. That they the I went to I watched the one on the biomass. That's why I didn't do the aqua one was because that biomass one was fascinating. And I didn't have to travel there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm talking about the four uh, meetings that the regions had, two in late October and two yeah, in uh, I'm, I'm agreeing. Yeah, that's what they were. I, I, I went to those two and they were they were great. They were fabulous. It was just really, really good stuff at, at every presentation by every region. So um, lots to learn about and, and stay up with. That's my report. Thank you very much. And I'm going to go around one more time beside the items you have report back. Um, do you have any other directors questions, comments, requests? Hearing none, I do have one. This is more of a question, perhaps request for request for general manager and I probably need council's help. So during today's item 5.9, we have, looks like a private text message that flashed across the screen. I know we are not supposed to delete things from an open meeting recording, but since there might be privacy issues for the person, I'm going to choose to see it as inadvertently sharing some of his or her private messages. Is there any way we could blank it out when we upload this video? Um, I didn't see any, was it in the chat? No, actually for some of us on our screen, I actually saw a text message. Um, I believe during the meeting, Sanjay referred to seeing some religious icon as uh, Director Sethi has alluded to. All I saw was a, what looks like a screen of a cell phone with text messages. Yes, there was something around that time frame. I saw it, there was a picture of a guy on mine. So and, uh, I'll, I'll apologize. I believe that was my grandfather's cell phone that may have inadvertently started sharing in between a presentation. <laughs> I, I apologize to the, to the district for that. Which is fine, accidents fine. happen, but is there any way we could preserve the person's privacy? Yeah, um, let me let me get back to you on that because we don't need to make a decision on that right now. Um, and I'll coordinate with uh, I'll coordinate with your general manager. On that. Yes, please, to the extent okay. possible. I I would like it. We don't need to delete it. Perhaps we could just blank it out. Okay. Because accidents happen. So thank you. That's all I have. I'm, I'm kind of wondering how that happened, that we're in the middle of a presentation and all of a sudden the presentation is long, no longer there and it's uh, 
uh, an image and and uh, and all this other stuff going on. How did that get into our system? I think one of our attendees accidentally shared the screen. I, I don't quite understand the controls, so I, I yeah, will. That's what it, it looks like. Uh, we'll take a look at it and uh, and go from there. Yeah, but how, how does that happen? Well, I mean, anybody can advert, like uh, we as participants um, can, can share a screen, uh, but usually I think you require uh, you know, sort of uh, permission from whoever has control of the screen first. So I don't exactly know what happened, but uh, between, uh, I think uh, your district secretary, Gina, myself, and uh, perhaps with uh, talking to director Akbari, we can figure out what happened. Yeah. Well, I, I was concerned because we have heard stories about how um, some pretty disturbing things suddenly get into a, a public meeting. Yeah, I don't think that was a, a classic Zoom bomb kind of thing. No, but- So we'll, we'll take a look at it. Maybe involve IT as necessary. Okay. So with that, that's all I have. And then I guess then let's move on to item eight, which is fairly long. We have three items. So item eight is closed session. Item 8.1 is pursuant to California Government Code section 54957.6, conference with labor negotiators, agency designated negotiators, Robert Shaver, Jennifer Solito, Jonathan Wunderlich, and Stacy Q. Employee organizations, operating engineers, local three, and ACWD operators association. Item 8.2 is pursuant to California Government Code Section 54956.8, conference with real property negotiators, property and three cattle company consisting of 131 parcels and approximately 50,535 acres in Alameda County, Santa Clara County, San Joaquin County, and San Luis County. Assessor's parcel numbers were furnished by owner's representative and are attached to this agenda. Agency negotiators, Robert Shaver and Ed Stevenson, negotiating parties, and three cattle company, LLC Rand Jr. and Rand Jr. trustee. Under negotiation, price and terms of payment. Item 8.3 is pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957, Public Employee Appointment, Title General Manager. So with that, Ms. Marku, would you do your magic and put us into a breakout session for item 8.1, please? Now oh, it's what, 12.40? The board has returned from closed session for item 8.1 pursuant to California Government Code section 54957.6, conference with labor negotiators, agency designated negotiators, Robert Shaver, Jennifer Solito, Jonathan Wenderlich, and Stacy Q. Employee organizations, operating engineers, local three and ACWD operators association. The board gave directions to labor, labor negotiators. Item 8.2, pursuant to California Government Code Section 54956.8, conference with real property negotiators, property and three cattle company consisting of 131 parcels and approximately 50,535 acres in Alameda County, Santa Clara County, San Joaquin County, and Stanislaus County. Assessor's parcel numbers were furnished by owner's representatives and are attached to this agenda. Agency negotiators, Robert Shaver and Ed Stevenson, negotiating parties and three cattle company, LLC Rand Jr. and Rand Jr. trustee, under negotiation, price and term of payment. For this item, the board gave directions to real property negotiators. Item 8.3, pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957, public employee appointment, title general manager, no action was taken for this item. So with that, I am happy to call the meeting adjourned.
pass the gavel or something. <laughs> Yes, and, and now that we're done, I'm going to symbolically pass the gavel as the outgoing board president to Director Akbari. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, Yeah, thank you. have Thank a lot you, everybody. of fun. <laughs> I'm excited. And congratulations to Director Weed, our new vice president. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on a personal note, I just want to say thank you to the directors. I know I will only see Director Akbari next week. So have a wonderful holiday. And thank you for working with me this year as a board president. We have a lot of very difficult discussions and a lot of very exciting discussions. We don't always agree, but I would like to let you know personally, I do appreciate the discussions and I do appreciate your cooperation. So thank you. Have a great holiday for those of you that I will not see until January. Bye, unless you have any comments, good night.